I don't think there's a single entrepreneur and who's, who's had success who didn't have years and years of like painstaking 20 hour days crying in the bathroom <laughs> in those early stages you think you're in this fishbowl every mistake is going to be just the biggest mistake it's, it's going to just be such a big blunder and derail your every dream you had and you realize once you get through those things that like no one's even paying attention to you it's a flash in the pan a mistake and you just move on and you're just wiser for it Hey, co-founders, welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins, a podcast where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies, discussing everything from the wins and losses of entrepreneurship to the next steps after the exit. To not miss out on these exciting stories, be sure to subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Benji. He was a sales manager at Cohort, and then he started a New York venture community that led into Founder Shield, a insurance company for startups. And then he's also a part of his own family office, Interplay, and he's launching some uh, new things that are coming around the bend. So I just want to say welcome, Benji. Good to have you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You have your own podcast that's about to come out. It's called The Shit Help Me. The, the Shit the shit Sessions, Yeah. Not the shits. That's a different podcast. That's season two. <laughs> that's like whenever you're in there for that's, too long. Yeah, yeah. That's what things go. That that's what things go real already. Yeah, and uh, real bad. Yeah. This is honestly, it's just it falls in line with a lot of the other stuff I'm doing. But I enjoy the podcast format. I enjoy talking to people. I'm a extreme extrovert by by nature. I, I love saunas. I love like new age wellness strategies and techniques, and it, it was incredibly impactful, especially post exit for me. Um, cause I went through like a very classic 1% problem of sold your company for a bunch of money and feeling lost and useless and imposter syndrome. And I was a, a therapist wet dream, I think. As soon as you exit, the therapists are like down the block, just waiting for you. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I was noticing that I would always have really interesting conversations in a sauna. You're definitely completely exposed in there. And number two, I think your heart's racing, you're sweating bullets, your mind's kind of starts to get a little loopy and you completely let loose. Or at least I've experienced that other people have like really let loose in those types of conversations and the types of conversations that I've had with like super interesting, successful people have been very different from if I was just like at a meal with them or having a coffee with them. I thought to myself, It'd be really interesting to host a podcast or like a, a video, audio, visual, YouTube channel podcast in which I'm talking to people that I find interesting and seeing where it goes and put the format inside of a sauna, which, you know, 190 degrees or higher. The goal is for the guests to last at least a certain amount of time. It's like hot ones, but it's your entire body. <laughs> exactly. A fully physical hot ones. The concept is that they're challenged or they're shamed if they can't beat the previous guest time. It's the personal fantasy factory that I'm like creating over here with that with other businesses I'm doing and just enjoying it. I think that the conversations that might come out of that are going to be really atypical, at least in compared to a lot of other podcasts that are um, you know, popular that are out there and present company excluded. It's a social thought experiment for me to see what happens. The only goal I have is, around it is consistently put out content. I'm not marketing it. I don't care if anyone listens to it. The benefit is more so for myself and to be able to express like my artistic side, I think, in, in a handful of different ways and through a handful of different platforms. I think that's a helpful way to look at it. And also the whole sauna idea. Are you just inviting people to be like, hey, you want a sauna with me? <laughs> basically. I Yeah, basically. <laughs> I have a solid list of a couple hundred potential guests that I'm close with or some dream guests. And the idea is just to have them over. I built this sauna in my backyard. It was actually a much more complicated project than I initially anticipated because I had to rig the sauna so that it could basically double as a recording studio. That's uh, interesting. I have a hard time making this work just in an office, let alone a sauna. You know what I mean? Like the audio is not working. I have working. no idea if it's going to work. <laughs> I have no idea if it's going to work. It's just going to be an iterative process and we're going to have to figure it out. We rigged the inside with these heat resistant high-end GoPro cameras and we saw like these mics from the ceiling 
with like these like heat resistant covers uh, on them. We'll see what the outcome of that is. I don't think audiophiles are going to be uh, tuning in and, uh, and enjoying it. It's something that I personally am excited about just sitting down in there with someone. And there's this also, there's this mental hurdle and challenge that when you are in a sauna with someone else and create this bond around this communal experience, it's, what, it's the same thing with starting a company, going through those challenges, the bond and the relationship and the level of debt in that relationship when you experience something challenging together, I think is really unique and special. And so trying to flash in the pan, create that over and over again and see what happens. Yeah. You're in the fits together, right? You're in a thick of it. <laughs> exactly. We're going to have a cold plunge outside as well. So I was about to say, I was like, as long as you can jump into something cool after that, that would feel great. Yeah. So I might, I might have like second segment. That's three minute quick questions in the, in the cold plunge. Right? I have to ask you really quick because I know that you're jumping into podcast life now. <laughs> For those that don't know you, how did you go from uh, being a sales manager to starting a company and founder shield? Yeah. High level story of that goes, I was the junior business development salesperson on this early stage venture back company called Cohort. This was in, I'll call it end of 2010, early 12, uh, 2011. We raised $3 million and uh, my boss, uh, founder of the, uh, co-founder of the company said, I, Benji, you deal with insurance because we're busy. Sure, I can handle it. I was a go-getter. I figured, um, you know, low man on the totem pole, say yes and, and figure out how to accomplish the goal afterwards. And I just remembered that the experience of finding a broker, going through the process of buying commercial insurance, the how debilitating it felt and how antiquated and archaic that entire process was. And I was so inundated in the technology world or in the startup world, I was just blown away by how little tech was being used or no tech was being used as related to commercial insurance. We had such a hard time getting insurance because in the insur insurance industry as a whole had very little faith in venture back businesses and early stage startups at that time. And the way they thought about those companies did not fit into what their traditional underwriting guidelines look like. And so companies like ours just had a difficult time. We're overpaying for insurance. That was just on top of how time consuming and how archaic the whole process was. Logged that painful experience in the back of my head. And as the next kind of year went on, pushed it aside, forgot about it, but probably towards the beginning or middle of 2012, the writing was on the wall that the company I was working at was not going to raise any more money. They were going to go under. They hadn't achieved product market fit yet. And I was thinking about what I wanted to do next and was talking to a mentor of mine. And we kind of got to the point where I realized all I really wanted to do was anything around sales, right? It's like I absolutely am obsessed, I'm addicted to the science of sales, the strategies behind sales. I would have always loved to be a professional athlete, but unfortunately didn't have the height or athletic ability to be able to ever get there. And so sales is in my mind is the kind of perfect antidote for that. Uh, there's so many parallels between sales and, and sports and athleticism that I was just drawn to it. And so kind of as I was going through that process, I thought back to that experience about buying insurance and I guess I was either overly confident or I guess properly confident. I'm not sure. Jury's still out. But that if any, if, if people, businesses buy insurance, I can convince them to buy it. Benji, um, that's that's a really hard industry to get into. I feel like it has a built-in moat because even whenever I think about insurance, my mind goes blank. I was tempted to talk about it many times from uh, a handful of different people. A lot of people told me that you can't just start an insurance uh, insurance brokerage or an insurance company. Yeah, X number of years of experience, you need all this knowledge. I guess they weren't right, or they were no, they were, they were they were definitely wrong. I think that there's a lot of there are significant benefits to not having any sort of experience in an industry before you try and disrupt that industry. Yeah. But you don't have the perspective of your prior experience in that industry and using that as a way to try and achieve success in the industry. For me, I looked at Founder Shield not as, oh, here's how we are going to disrupt insurance. 
because I didn't even know what it meant to disrupt insurance outside of digitizing the process. I really thought of it and I was inspired by the Tony Shaper. Oh, the money customer experience. I think it's called delivering happiness, something along those lines. One quote really stuck out uh, to me in that book, which is Tony Shea is talking about the fact that he doesn't even like shoes. He owns like two or three pairs of shoes. And he gets into this whole conversation about Zappos is not about, it's not a shoe company, right? Shoes are just a means to what they're really delivering, which is extreme levels of happiness and extreme levels of pleasure and excitement. And the vehicle in which they do that through happens to be through shoes. And so I thought of that. I said, you know what? The challenge I put to myself was shoes are great. It's like a gift to yourself. They're nice. Imagine if you could deliver some sort of positive vibe, some sort of happiness around something that people push off dread doing, which is buying insurance. It's like a necessary evil that people just have to deal with. Like imagine if you can achieve like some level of excitement or happiness or in my dreams, I was thinking that what if people were excited to get on the phone with us? I'm trying to imagine a happy experience and I'm struggling here. How did we pull it off? I think it was extreme levels of attentiveness towards like customer service and customer support and really getting into the mind of our customers and understanding what their pain points are and understanding what their stress levels were at any given point in time and how we could be a value add to their ultimate goal, which is to achieve whatever dream or level of success they had built up for their company. And so if we can be a vehicle that allows them to even increase the odds of achieving their dream by 0.01%, we'd be accomplishing our goal. So Benji, what were some, you ended up selling this for nine figures. How did you, what were the inputs? Did you have co-founders? Did you raise rounds of investment? Yeah, I had a co-founder. We bootstrapped the whole time, never raised a penny. And it was very difficult, but a very thankful and very strategic decision not to raise capital. And a old mentor of mine was, I definitely give credit to him for pushing that thought in our head. And even as we were getting interest from a lot of uh, funds, he kept on telling us, just grow at your own pace. It's a lesson that I've taken on as I'm advising other startups, as I'm on to like my next things. It was the most important decision and it definitely was a key reason that led to the success we had and the ultimate exit that we had. We had to really be confident in our internal investments where we were going to put our money to work. It ended up making us much better, smarter decision makers and making the right decision more often than not. And I think if we were in a position where we had a ton of cash and a ton of runway to make mistakes, we didn't really have that flexibility. It allowed us to achieve an exit that was really unique in, in our industry because we were both a profitable company and a high growth, 100% year over year company over almost a decade and a company that over that decade of time had developed and built a lot of proprietary technology. And the combination of all of those things allowed us to have like access to a, a really large pool of interest in acquirers, which I think ultimately led to the exit multiple that we ended up achieving. There's not so many people in the space. So if I was an insurance company and I was looking at potential acquisitions, it's not like e-commerce, right? You have a very slim set of options. Typically for most strategic acquirers, so most insurance companies, larger insurance right. companies, there's minimal organic growth year over year, especially once they hit a certain size. And most of their growth, growth is attributed to, to strategic acquisitions. And there's a pretty active M&A market, but it's mostly traditional insurance brokerages buying smaller traditional insurance brokerages and basically utilizing their book of business, book of revenue to determine the uh, acquisition value. You're definitely solving a pain point. We're both part of this group where a bunch of other founders talk about issues that they're facing. And did you see that thread on insurance? It's on the personal side. So even though it's not like on the company side, even though it did touch on that, it's all these people that have had massive insurance plans before and yet they're still scratching their head about, oh, how do I go to the doctor's office? Which is yeah. funny to think about. <laughs> it's wild. It's, uh, the truth is we actually, we had many opportunities to dip our toes and dive into the personal line side and, and health insurance side as well. And we 
were very strategic in not allowing ourselves to go in that direction and trying to expand our TAM that way. But that was mostly because like sales organization we had built up internally, the skill they had and the way we had trained them was really focused on their ability to sell into companies, which is a very different kind of path and strategy that needs to get utilized versus selling it to individuals. You're dealing with a much more emotional buyer when you're dealing with personal insurance yeah. um, than you are with commercial insurance. It's just a different set of tools that are required in order to, I think, achieve the level of success I would have wanted to achieve in that area. On your website somewhere, I saw that you were talking about like your proliferation into the VC marketplace. Is that part of your go-to-market is you would go to VC companies and just be like, hey, we can cover your entire portfolio, essentially? When we first started the company, um, you know, uh, September, October 2012, I made sure to brand our business as insurance for startups. That was like the initial tagline. And the reason why we did that was because there was no, we knew that at that point there were no other insurance brokerages that focus on startups. And on top of that, we were confident that even if there was a competing larger insurance brokerage, one with more experience who could say, oh yeah, we, we work with high growth companies or startups, they wouldn't be able to say they exclusively work with startups. Right, yeah. And be, and be able to market that, hey, this is all we do, all we know. We're like super, super like narrow, deep and not wide area of expertise. and. I think that allowed us to develop a level of comfort between us and our prospective buyers. We did something similar, like we were outsourcing for startups. And then as yeah. they grew, we grew. It was like, yeah, they might be like a Y Combinator company and they just got funding. And then eventually they ramp up to hundreds of people and, and you're just along for the ride. Yeah, that's exactly it. Some of our early clients, and then we rode the wave with them, were like Coinbase, Robinhood, which two like pretty monumental clients that we worked with. We were working with Coinbase too in the early days. Yeah. People were getting paid in like cryptocurrency and we're like, oh, okay, that's cool. So I had met with Fred and Brian and we were just shooting the shit, talking about the standard types of insurance that they needed. Do you know insurance, GL for their office, property, all, all of those kind of basic insurance needs. And I remember I'd asked them, I said, I'm like, I'm not a, a crypto expert. I can't even buy crypto yet because this is like early 2013 in New York. You can really buy it. I said, I'm like, but I can imagine a scenario where people have a significant percentage of their net worth or a meaningful amount of, of their capital sitting in on your servers and your, on your platform. And she, I, I told them, I was like, I, I think we could potentially do what a company like a PayPal does or even like an FDIC for banks. We could probably promote and market the fact that Coinbase, that any deposits in Coinbase are fully insured and backed by Lloyds of London or a legitimate insurance provider. And especially at that time where like crypto was at its infancy and there was so much fear around the unknown. I mean, look at FTX and this stuff. Right? So oh, yeah, part of it's like- I remember when Mt. Gox happened, which was I think 2014 maybe. Uh, that almost derailed this uh, this entire concept. We basically worked really closely with Fred and Brian and ended up developing the first ever insurance product for cryptocurrency. Oh, that's um, awesome. Ended up getting up to, I think it was like a billion dollars in capacity in that like initial structure. And Fred and I, uh, I th we must have flown to London a dozen times to meet with. Fred had to literally teach blockchain technology and crypto to 50 different heads of the different Lloyd syndicates, all white haired, middle-aged men. <laughs> You're like, yeah, we, you send the money where? <laughs> like, where does it go? <laughs> exactly. And then uh, they're like middle-aged proper British men who at first were like, I'm like, this is never, they're never going to understand this. Uh, how did you get them to sign off on that? Now, how would, <laughs> that seems like a little bit of a stretch. I don't think I was overly strategic. I think I was just, absolutely relentless yeah um, i'm gonna make it happen i have this tendency to over promise and then do everything possible to deliver on that promise sometimes it's bitten me in the ass but in this situation it uh it worked out well you're it's working so, backwards you're like this is going to happen and then you're like how are we going to do this i can't get away from that even to this day i still do that and it's just I think we might be just the way I uh, motivate myself and the way I guess I, I work best. I like to be thrown into the fire and a sink or swim experience and mentality is uh, beneficial to me, I think.
maybe I'm just a, a masochist. But anyways, that that experience with Coinbase led us down this path where we realized that there was this whole nother opportunity to not just be a tech enabled, tech automated commercial insurance brokerage, but to be a truly tech enabled, vertically integrated insurance experience. We realized that we could go down this path where we could not only create a really optimal customer experience from the broker's side of things, but we felt like we could get to a point to achieve what we believed was like the the ultimate goal, which is full uh, fully own the entire process A to Z, because that's the only way you can truly create custom specialized experience for, for your clients. And so that was the path that we went down and that really unlocked a lot of growth for us and a lot of innovation then ultimately led to our exit. You were there for 11 years. So it was like a, an overnight success that took 11 years to build and yeah, launch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so every founder I know has, from the external point of view, uh, you know, overnight made it big. And I don't think there's a single entrepreneur and who's, who's had success who didn't have years and years of like painstaking 20 hour days crying in the bathroom. <laughs> I've lost count of the number of times this happened to me, but uh, most people don't see that side of it. Cause you're and, and honestly, the truth is it's the beauty of being an entrepreneur. And I think once you get through the other side, you realize it is that in those early stages, you think you're in this fishbowl, right? You think that every mistake is going to be just the biggest mistake. It's, it's going to just be such a big blunder and derail your every dream you had. And it's life or death. And then you realize you know, once you get through those things that like no one's even paying attention to you <laughs> <laughs> and people, it's a flash in the pan of like mistake and you just move on and you're just wiser for it. I think I realized I could take a lot more punches than I thought I could. And the company could take a lot more punches than yeah. like, it feels like the end of days, but it's not quite. We had like um, an earthquake take out our office and we we're like, oh, what are we going to do now? And then we had like we had offices in the Philippines and there was like a typhoon like every season and the pandemic was like a military style quarantine. And we're like, we have people on site. What do we do with all these like computers? Like, some people can't get home because they like literally blocked off the highways and you're like, we'll figure it out. And you do. It's, it's your only choice. Right? And I think it's uh, for anyone who thinks this is the, the road towards an like, exit or whatever your ultimate goal is as an entrepreneur is just paved with butterflies and rainbows. It is not the case. There are just as many, if I think, if not more down days than there are like super positive up days. And I think the best entrepreneurs just have that like superpower to be so resilient in the face of that and be able to like forget it. It reminds me of, uh, I can't remember who it is. I know it definitely applies to like Steph Curry, which is any good shooter in the NBA. Basically, if they miss 10 shots, they think the 11th shot is going it, right? And they're like, and they constantly are forgetting about their last miss. It's it's over. It's done. On to the next. That's our superpower is we can't remember. <laughs> exactly. We're like, a, I don't know. A, a Mayfly or something. Dory, Dory in Finding Nemo. <laughs> I got three little kids. So my, my Disney references are very on point right now. I do think that there's probably easier paths to entrepreneurship than like what you we went through probably. Buying a business is probably an easier way to get into it. And there's pre-established processes. I feel like there's an easier way. There has to be an easier way. I don't know. I bought a business now. I've went through another M&A deal that ended up just burning up and into flames in the 11th hour. We're in LOI on another one right now. And so I don't think it's easier. I think it's just a different set of challenges. I also think it's different depending on what your mindset is and your objectives are going in. I like personally can't, like I'm, I'm so bad at looking at a, a target acquisition or a business and saying like, okay, this is a really good investment. Just keep keep the ship steady. Like incremental changes over time. I'm like, no, let's blow this up and, and, and turn this into biggest thing and whatever. It doesn't even matter what industry. It could be in like adult diapers. I'd be like, we're revolutionizing adult diapers. For me, at least that mindset has been helpful because having like insane, absurd dreams and ones that are, I think, from an external perspective, like shocking or laughable, create like a, a certain amount of motivation and eagerness to prove people wrong. 
that I personally find exhilarating. And I also think that if you shoot for the, uh, for the moon, right, you just, you, you, you fall in the stars, right? You're whatever you end up, end up doing and, and, and succeeding with, even if it's not that like outlandish dream, it's way further along that path than if you just had a very reasonable, strategic, do like achievable dream on, on an annual basis. I came on bouncing back and forth between like reasonable and not reasonable. So yeah, we're going to revamp this entire industry. And then I'm like disappointed. I'm like, why isn't it revamped yet? But on the other yeah. hand, you're moving forward and you're getting tens of millions of dollars in revenue and that's falling. That's pretty good. Like that's a win. It's great. I think different entrepreneurs love different stages of, of a startup life. Like for me, I love like the zero to one or call it maybe zero to one, one to two, where it's an unlimited amount of chaos and you are forced to, to make decisions with one hand tied behind your back and operating on a lot of intuition and gut. I love, you know, wearing multiple hats and having, having a small team and creating like a really unique culture and putting together like a, a dream that feels, um, misguided on some level. I love that side. Once, once a business gets to a point where, you know, it's steady, it's repeatable nine times out of 10, once a company hits that stage, people like shift their mindset to, okay, don't fuck this up now. That's more like a save what you have and expand, right? Yeah. That's, that's what I'm like. That's for me personally, I, I get a lot less motivated at that stage. I think I like the zero to one and then I can skip one to two and then two to three. I'll be happy. Yeah. You can start up a landing page. You can build the initial team. You can bring in the first X million in, in revenue and, and get it going. And then there's the awkward like middle stage. Like I'm going to call it the adolescent teenager where like things are uncomfortable and you don't quite have experts in all the positions. And then I'll come back and I'll be excited whenever I have all my seats filled with fantastic people that are really know their shit and are kicking ass in, in each area. And then I feel like they're like amplifying each of the different segments. But I think that I, I don't even know if two to three is part of the saying. We're entrepreneurs. We're creating our own paths on a continuous basis. We need to tell uh, Peter Thiel about the one to zero to one, one to two, two to three. There's yes. more to it. We do that and we can get juiced on steroids with it. I don't know, Peter, if you're watching this, you need to get into a, a sauna and say hi to Benji. We'll happily take sponsorship dollars from the voided up Olympic game that he's starting. It sounds amazing. I want to see uh, athletes just destroy like previous records with uh, performance enhancing drugs. That's basically like what American Gladiator was like trying to do in like the early 90s, turning it into like, Olympic level competition. It will definitely be interesting. Like as long as it's, how do you say safe? Like how do you put performance enhancing to a point or else doesn't that get problematic? They haven't get provided enough details there. Right? I assume it's like, a t like to some certain level. If you go too far, you have roided up anger issues happening on the track. You know, you're like, hey, focus. Maybe that's part of the competition. It's boxing and track and field together. <laughs> uh, we should talk about what, uh, so tell tell me about the exit. What was that like for you and, and what are you looking to do next? Such a unique ruling and just exhausting and rewarding experience. It, it, it was just a comp it was every possible emotion all rolled up together. The way we ended up uh, selling, because we were bootstrapped, we didn't, we didn't have any pressure to sell or anything like that. We weren't trying to reach some sort of valuation and raise another round. We didn't have any sort of time pressure on us, but we had to end up getting two like unsolicited LOIs in December of 2020. And they were interesting enough from a total dollar standpoint. They were like, okay, shit. This is what people are willing to pay for us. This is crazy. We ended up uh, interviewing a handful of uh, investment bakers, settled on one, and then just did the gauntlet. Six, seven months, we had, a, I think we had 77 first round meetings. And we had this scenario where we had interest in a lot of different um, acquirers, investors. So we went, we kind of well, went four paths. We went down the path of a SPAC, considered it, went down the path of private equity, went down, down the path of growth fund um, and, and kind of raising our first round, but like a, a massive one. And then we went down the strategic path. Through that process, I remember it was COVID time. So we were still like, still in the stages where people are not really traveling. And so our bankers, for the first probably like month, 
we did like dry runs and just like practicing the pitch. There's a different strategy when you're pitching a client versus when you're pitching someone who's looking to buy you, right? You're dealing with a different set of goals or incentives and have to be a chameleon in a different way as it relates to those pitches, had key points. And we were talking, I think it was like two or three meetings a day, an hour and a half each. It it sucked. Um, it was just absolutely exhausting. It broke me down this time. I had so much doubt during it. I'm like, this is, we're, we're not going to sell. And I'm lying to my employees. Even though I wasn't lying, but I'm like, I can't communicate with. Them. You have to keep it to yourself, right? Like yeah, you can't. Exactly. Um, and you know, I'm like, but they know something's up because I'm not as like um, involved, involved or attentive um, yeah. to their needs. It was just absolutely grueling. And wake up in the middle of the night, just like sweating bullets, thinking like, oh my god, I, I messed up that uh, that pitch today, or I messed up that pitch a week ago. But I guess there's some type of level of resilience. We ended up. Pushing through that, getting to that next round. I think we, we had 10 or 11 LOIs all said and done. I think part of it was that we were a unique company in the sense that like we were a high growth tech company with a bunch of proprietary technology and we had really healthy, like kind of venture level organic growth year over year. And we were profitable every year that we operated like 20% growth, 20% EBITDA or something like that. Like you, you were blowing out the growth target. We did not plan it this way, but we went through this, uh, I mean, a process. I couldn't have picked a more perfect time. We, it was, it basically started right as that like initial level of fear of COVID was dissipating and confidence in the market started to increase a, a little bit. And there had been so much like, dry capital ready to be deployed because no one did anything for nine months. Yeah. So the market was just like foaming at the mouth, wait, like needing to make acquisitions. And so we came in just at an absolute perfect time and end up selling to a company called BRP and the rest is history. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. Running a process is not, not fun at all. I think I talked to 22 different bankers and brokers to try to figure out how to take us to market. It is a lot of people and uh, it's an interesting process. Your bankers are your best friends until you sign the LOI with the, with the company you tend to sell to. And then they basically can't be trusted at that point. <laughs> They're like just trying to push through the deal. Yeah, the, yeah. And- no, no, ignore that. No, we're not going to push here. Otherwise, like it was like, no, we can't push on these terms. They're going to shut the deal down. I'm telling you. And but my, my next exit, if I ever am that instinct to go down that path again, I will definitely not hold any punches or requests because I think we could have been able to be even more aggressive than we were. I, I hear a lot from bankers and brokers are like, just think about the overall pie or just think about the big picture. Yeah. And you're just like, oh man, I'm just trying to get this through. Potentially, depending on if there's an earnout or not, this might be my life for the next two years. It's important to get the right terms in the first place. <laughs> hey, podcast listeners, whenever I was first scaling my business, Support Ninja, I was trying to figure out if there was an operating system or a framework that would help me figure out how do I structure these departments? How do I get the right people in the right seats? How do I navigate building my uh, standard operating procedures? And it was at that point that I came across Traction by Gino Wickman and the EOS framework. Um, Highly recommend it. If you guys are looking for an operating system to run your business, check out EOS Worldwide. And we also made this entrepreneurship network called Founder Org. That's a great way to connect with other entrepreneurs that are also figuring out how to run and scale their business. If you guys are interested in either, check out eosworldwide.com and founderorg.com. All right, back to the pod. You're starting a family office slash almost like a venture studio. It's like a combination of both, right? The, the initial idea was just like set this up, set these vehicles up like from a, like a tax saving standpoint and just proper financial structures, setting it up. And as I finished up that first layer of like legal work, I was trying to figure out what the strategy was, what I wanted to do next. Initially, I considered not doing anything forever. I think my financial advisor would have preferred that. Yeah. We would make more money if we did nothing. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's um, not definitely not looking to get political, but it doesn't matter to me. But there's, there's always these different articles about Trump and how if he had never done anything based on his inheritance, <laughs> he'd be worth like, like a significant multiple more than he is now, right? 
the world will be missing out on Trump steaks Trump and shoes. Trump Academy and shoes. Yeah, like the world would be missing these things. But honestly, I, I can't relate to a lot with, with him, but I can definitely relate to that asset, which is it, it's at that point, it's not about the accumulation of wealth. It's you like you are you become you feel dead inside if you're not like pursuing those things that you're passionate about, regardless of whether that exposes you to certain levels of financial risk. Did you have the identity crisis a little bit like after oh, that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Identity me too. Identity crisis, depression. What what do I tell fine. people whenever I meet them meet them at dinner? What do you do? I'm like I'm just living. I I, always, I would always like mix it up. I'd be like sometimes I say to retire. Sometimes I would say I'm a stay at home dad. Sometimes I tell the truth. Whatever I said, I was uncomfortable with saying. Yeah, it's just different answer each time. What do you do? I I watch Finding Nemo like a few yeah. times a day, and I hang out with my kids and <laughs> just makes have a different answer every time they ask. De- definitely didn't know how to navigate it. It's like one of those things. I don't even know how. I can't really prepare for it. Right. I told myself, like, I was like, um, don't let your identity get wrapped up in this thing. Like, it's not going to last forever. It's a sandcastle, right? The tide's going to yeah. come out at some point. And uh, yeah, and my identity. So, totally got wrapped up in it. And yeah, I, even though I saw it coming, I couldn't do anything about it for a decade, basically. My brain was in this, like, very, like, unique f- fight or flight mode. And so, I basically was in this survival mode where anything that would distract me, from achieving my goals for as it related to founder on that business, it basically just got pushed off to the side, right? It basically just didn't hit my I don't know, frontal cortex or whatever part of the brain it was going to hit. And very soon after we sold, it's almost as if like all those, like everything opened up in my head and like it had room for other thoughts. And I started thinking about things that I was like, I didn't, I haven't thought about this ever. And then I didn't have answers, right? I was prepared to to deal with those questions and thoughts and identity crisis and all of that. And so, you know, instead instead of being prepared for that, it was more so I just had to pick up the pieces and put them back together afterwards. I was like, I need a vehicle for whatever's next. So like I did operator equity, which is like like the operators and entrepreneurs are like the LPs and like the funds and you acquire a company and then you guys can do joint deals together in the future. And so I started buying companies and then I started doing passion projects, right? I'm expanding a lot more. And so just doing one thing, I'm doing a bunch of different things. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing on that side with your family office and what company did you end up buying? Are you planning? Yeah. So or? the path that I ended up choosing to go down from like a family office strategy after trial and error was I got to a point where I realized I'm an operator and I'm like a risk taker and disruptive by nature and putting myself in those positions and in those experiences is what excites me. And so I really shifted focus of a family office strategy completely away from any sort of passive investments. I basically told my financial advisor, like they, they're in charge of the past investments. I, I get no excitement out of it at all whatsoever. I could, we, I just had a, for an angel investment I made, because I think the first, uh, I'd been making angel investments and in definitely the first 18 months post exit, I went like real crazy on angel investments. But I just had this one company that I had an angel investment in that exited for 750 million around. Like that was a company that I invested, I think it was at like a three and a half million dollar valuation. Oh, wow. Um, the only enjoyment I get out of it is that I know the founder, I know how hard he worked and he's like the, just the uh, embodiment of like persistence and grit and resilience. And I'm excited for him. There's no, I, I there's no joy out of it for me. Cause I don't, I didn't do anything. I finally realized I'm like, okay, I have to do stuff. Otherwise, like it's just going to be an unenjoyable dragging my feet through the mud process. And so structured the family office where it, we only focus on building new companies and majority stake or 100% takeover acquisition. The the second thing that I wanted to, I'm in this position now where I started Founder Shield and Scale Underwriting when I was 24. I was engaged. I wasn't married yet, didn't have kids. And by the time we sold in 2021, my oldest was four at the time. And now I have, I have three kids 
and they never have really seen me work at the like early beginning stage entrepreneurial level that consumed so much of my life um, and that I was proud of and yielded the results that we ended up achieving. And I really wanted them to like see that firsthand. I, I felt like it was the best way for me to teach them those lessons and those values because those like soft skills that I think make the difference between good and great for an entrepreneur, they're hard to teach. And I thought the best way that I could do it for them was just by being the embodiment of that and, and living that life. Yeah. And so really that was really important to me. And then on top of that, I really just wanted to wanted to get my feet wet into a bunch of different things that I had no experience in and no business being in. And I wanted to start do things that were polar opposite of what I had been doing and things that were more tangible. Cause I felt that on top of the trying to be like a, an example of, of hard work for my kids, I also thought that it would be so much more exciting for them to witness like from see from infancy, from a ceiling idea through whatever the ultimate goal is of something like truly tangible and something that they can experience firsthand. Hey, podcast listeners, if you guys are interested in cold email outbound outreach that actually works or thought leadership and how to build a community around some of the things that you're working on, I highly recommend incendiumstrategies.com. They're not just sponsoring this podcast, but they're also helping us with a lot of the communities that we run on the back end. Uh, so if that's something that resonates with you guys and you're interested in learning more, check out incendiumstrategies.com. Thank you guys. And back to the pod. Benji, is this going to be the Paddle United Sports Club that you're yeah. launching? There were two things. Paddle United Sports Club, that was the one we're launching. And then I also bought another is a indoor 20,000 square foot, like franchise or sort of path of growth, kids facility, sports facility, summer camps, things like that. It makes a ton of money. I honestly didn't know anything about this industry. Someone introduced me to the former owner of it. It was something that I'm like, oh, this is really interesting from just a profit center standpoint. And they they don't use any tech. It's like, it they almost are like treating it like a real estate play in the sense of it exists. They make money and that's it. Yeah. And you can just hold on to it forever. Which obviously is not what I'm doing. I'm like, okay, how do we revolutionize the <laughs> the indoor sports game? <laughs> the indoor birthday party industry. Both of those businesses are ones that like I now bring my kids to show them, yeah. hey, this is the change we're making. Hey, Andy, my oldest son, who's gonna be eight, like I asked him for like his input on uh on this superdome business. I told him I was like, You're the target demo. What is it that you want here? What would be the perfect birthday party here? What would be like the coolest arcades that we should put in here? And so it's really exciting to have this different sort of entrepreneurial and startup path and journey, in which I can share in that experience with my kids. I have a fascination for secret rooms. So if you happen to put any secret rooms in that thing, I, I will check it out. I'll figure it out. Secret rooms are not a not necessarily the best way to maximize utilization, but... <laughs> They've opened my office behind a, a secret room in a bookshelf or something like that. Yeah, and in, in Padel United. Yeah, yeah and then the, yeah, the Padel like is. Oh yeah, tell yeah. me about Padel. I think going through like the mental low points and struggles post exit, one thing that really got me through it was basically being super aggressive and trying anything and everything from a wellness standpoint. And I got super into cold plunging and cryo and and sauning red light therapy as well, even some sensory deprivation tank stuff. And so it, it really had such a net positive impact on my leg. And I was traveling to all these places to try and do these things because the town that I live in, area I live in, in Jersey, they just didn't have any of these spots around. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I was like, I'm just going to buy all of this stuff and put it in my backyard or my somewhere in my house and make my own little wellness retreat in my home. And my financial advisor called me up like you have you Benji you're an idiot stop doing this get a retail location and put all that stuff there and like go there for it even if it's just for you go there for it but like don't like waste money doing this in your own house like yeah it could be a business or was he seeing it more as like a tax like thing yeah it's a bit yeah or both like, 
for both, but mostly it's like you can, even if the business fails, it's still a business expense if you try right. and attempt to make it into a business. Yeah. And so I said, I'm like, okay, you know what? I, I really wanted a kind of like a social wellness club in, in my town. I, I thought like this area of Jersey, which is it's affluent, it's beautiful homes, upper middle class or upper class suburban, suburban towns and neighborhoods. I was like, there's nothing here really that provides that sort of offering. So as I was going through that process of looking for it, and also at the same time, I'd been introduced to Fidel and I was fascinated less by the sport necessarily and more so by like the hockey stick, like growth metrics it was, it, it was showing and the, like the financial analysis and unit economics of that business, because unlike, unlike tennis, Fidel requires significantly less square footage. And it's four players instead of two players. So yeah. you basically have like a two and a half X plus another two X on top of that potential earnings per compared to uh, square footage um, between Fidel and tennis. And so I knew that racket sports in general were like super popular in this area. And I knew that there was like a lack of supply and a massive demand for indoor facilities. I could combine those two like those two efforts, those two ideas, the Padel side, which is social at its core and like social wellness club, we might be able to create something like really special, really unique. This is really cool. I'm looking at a graph, looking at growth of like global sales of Padel rackets and like the, these stats are old too. So it's looking at 83,000 in 2002 to 409,000 in 2017. And oddly, Spain and Argentina have the most at this point, Sweden has a bunch of Norway. It, it started in Mexico. Spain is where it really took off. Now it's the second most popular uh, recreational sport behind soccer in Spain. There are okay. around eight, 8 million active weekly player, recreational players in Spain. It's grown exponentially in the UAE, Dubai, Qatar, all, all over the Middle East. I would say in the past probably 36 months, we've started to see a significant increase in interest and then investment in both the UK and in the US. And there's a lot of very wealthy individuals and funds pouring and athletes, celebrities pouring a ton of capital into the growth of the sport in the US. And it's 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 really fascinating because right now as we currently uh, currently stand, there are less than I think 400 public courts, public padel courts available in the US and it's the demand and the chatter around it far outweighs the supply. Like there's a massive supply issue here. So there's a massive push to increase that supply tenfold over the next couple of years to yeah. be able to support the demand. In my opinion, it has all the benefits of a sport like pickleball, which obviously became it like just grew Huge. at, it became massive in the, in the States, but it isn't played anywhere else, by the way. And it, so it has all the growth potential and the benefits of, of pickleball in the sense that w I think the best thing about pickleball is that anyone can really take it up. It's very easy to take up. You don't, there's not a, lar a big learning curve other than their confusing scoring system. And Fidel is, Fidel is very similar from that standpoint. It's really easy to pick up. The difference between the two is that Fidel is kind of like chess in that it's, it, it requires a, like a different level of strategy and a never ending pursuit of growth in your skills and your strategies and in, in, in becoming a better player. And it also requires a different level of athleticism. So it requires a lot more agility. You're, you're, it's a better workout. You're breaking a significant sweat and real athletes like professional Fidel players are like incredible athletes who are on the same level to like athletes in a lot of other sports just from a athletic ability. And it's one of the sports where I, I believe by in 2032, it's going to be introduced into the Olympics. Or, is this a franchise or is this something that you just came up with? And no, this is no, I, yeah, no, we just came up with it. Okay, cool. If it yeah. does turn into a franchise, then let me know. Yeah. I can't say it being a, a franchise business, especially like our the strategy there is like very, it's very amenity rich like luxury for kind of a country club vibe 
Yeah, I'm looking it's, at this. Uh, you have cryotherapy. You have you're looking at premium cafes and juice bar, children's play area. Actually, the children's play area is pretty sweet. Uh, that was a uh, an important thing I think for our, our, because our strategy is very much focused on what I think is it, it's even less about Padel and, and wellness. It's really about what I believe is like the core issue that like I'm trying to solve for, which is why you saw this in, like at, during COVID, post COVID, where a tremendous amount of wealth and millennials moved outside of like large metropolitan cities, moved into the suburbs. And there's just a lack of like unique, special, transformative, like retail experiences in the burbs. Like there's the idea of a third place, right? And yeah. burbs are missing that. And exactly. the third place, for those that don't know, is it's not your home. It's not your office. It's what used to be the bar or the, the club or the lounge. And, and we don't have that in the burbs. Exactly. It's it's some place to like to to recharge, to escape, and to be like communal, right? To meet yeah. new people. I think that's one of the things, the difficulties of being in the burbs. I came from New York City before this, unlike the city where you're constantly meeting people all the time, especially post exit. I found myself like, oh, I have basically been in my house, and so really, just I'm meeting the people that I'm already friends with, but not really experiencing meeting new people and being exposed to new ideas, new personality types, all, all the stuff that makes life worth living have you heard of the garage in park city it's like um super car storage artwork but it's, it's a third place right you're bringing yeah. people together and you're making friends that have common interests or, or slightly different interests if you can solve particularly grown men past the age of 30 making new friends you solved a, a major issue in america i think padel is padel really lends itself to that because it's a two-on-two sport and you're community organ organizing it is a core area where you have to succeed in order to build a successful Fidel club. And the reason for that is for the most part, it's hard to find like three other people all at the same time who can play. Unlike tennis, you can find one person to play with. But in this yeah. situation, the goal is you want to play, we'll have three other people like to play with, introduce you to you, all of that. And you know, I think like Remedy Place has done a really good job of like social wellness side all like the true wellness out of retail experience, right? Or club experience where they've made cold plunges and other ship is another one in Brooklyn that's done the same thing where they've made cold plunges and sauna a more, a more communal experience, right? Former Soviet Union places that used to be like the Banya. Did you ever go out to like the bathhouse? I love, I love the Russian bathhouses. I, the Russian bathhouses, the Turkish bathhouses, I, those are fantastic. In the city, that's where I used to go. They didn't have these sort of like newer luxurious saunas it was always these in shambles just look they look like they were 500 <laughs> years old with 80 year old naked russian men just that's how you want it that's the authentic experience <laughs> i only can hope and dream that one day we can at padel we can have just a bunch of naked old russian men just chilling in the sauna that's the dream it's a dream yeah <laughs> i my wife is belarusian so that country like on the corner of yeah. ukraine and, and russia and we went to go visit her family in Minsk and they got on their head of, oh, we're going to give Connor the American, a true Banya Russian experience. And I'm like, okay, cool. And they found this place online. We get in this cab and it's snowing and he's going up the mountain and I see do not enter signs. And mm -hmm. this cabbie just doesn't give a heck. Like he's just going, like he's off-roading, going up this mountain, past these signs. And we get to like this warehouse, like this kind of like compound kind of thing. And it has a guard thing at the front and it has two German shepherds chained up and it looks like a fast and furious kind of like safe house and you're like okay cool like this is a banya this is supposed to be like a bathhouse authentic experience and this big old guy completely bald comes out in like a robe in the snow like wearing nothing else and he's like, yeah come here come here I'm like all right where are we going this is this going to be safe and the family's <laughs> like all right let's go they go inside there's like locker rooms that we get undressed and we they do the thing and they're like let's like give Connor like the authentic experience and like, you, do you know the birch sticks? Oh yeah, I've yeah, I've done it all. I've done the yeah. whole thing. You're a pro. Yeah, I am the future host of a sonnet podcast, the first of its kind. So <laughs> oh I'm my like, gosh! If you did your guests with the birch sticks to push the heat, That's exactly. Patreon. I don't. Know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Whenever they took me to this place, they have this, the big guy. They're like bringing the big guy. So this big guy comes in with the sticks, and then he starts doing it to me, and I'm like, oh, I'm terrified. And then he he jumps and does the most beautiful swan dive into the cold plunge I've ever seen a big man do, barely like a ripple. And he's like, come here. And I'm like, I'm not sure if I want to do this. 
And he's like, oh, come here. And so I, I jump in and then he cradles me and, and rocks me around in a slow circle. And he's relaxed and I'm like stiff. I'm like, I can't move. And that was my authentic Russian Banya experience. Here's the beauty about all that stuff, right? The like community interaction, meeting new people, I think is so important. And I think the other part is I don't think we like as a society or at least as Americans, I don't think we like expose ourselves to challenges and failure as, as mm. much as we, as much as we really should, as much as is healthy for us. Because I think that there's a certain experience and feeling you get when you overcome an obstacle, when you, or when you put yourself in a, in a challenging position or, or a challenging situation where success or failure is, or success is not guaranteed. And yeah. you come out of that the other side, right? And you come out of it alive, whether you succeed or fail, right? Failure it's, and success are relative, but yeah, hopefully exactly. Um, but it's so crucial to like a human experience. Uh, like that tradition where like once a year you pick a major challenge to push yourself. What do you, is that called something? It, yeah. It, there's a Japanese term for it. It's so funny. I just read a book like, like a month ago ex- about this exact thing. We need to figure out the name for this thing, though. There's definitely a name for it. Hey, Benji, we are at time. How should people okay. find you? How should people find me? Please don't. Uh, Please don't. He does <laughs> yeah, not exist. Just don't, don't look for me. Don't find me now. I don't know. People find me. I don't know. Google my name. I'm not sure. Uh, go to LinkedIn. I'm not uh, I'm not big on, on X or anything else like that. Check out Padel United Sports Club. Yeah, PadelUnitedSportsClub.com. And then you also have the Schwitz, which is coming out, which is a secret yes. podcast. And if you find it, then you're lucky. I hope no one <laughs> ever listens to it. I hope I do it for the next 10 years. I hope I get to a thousand episodes of it. And I hope the only person, I honestly, I probably will never listen to it because I like, I disdain listening to uh, myself or watching myself in an interview or TV. So, I can almost guarantee that I will not be a listener of the podcast. So no one else listen to it. Please don't. You won't know where to find it. <laughs> There's nothing you could say that would make this blow up more. <laughs> Please do not find this. This is a secret. It's just for me, and it's on the internet for everyone else to see. <laughs> listen, if you, unless if you're into me interviewing Mark Cuban, nips blasting, then then it's for you. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's the sell side of you. Like, you, you so sold. That's, uh, yeah, that's definitely a I sell. Guess so. I guess so. I don't know. Yeah, I can't help it. <laughs> Benji, but, I appreciate the chat, and, and we'll be in touch. Yeah, All right, cool. Likewise. Good to see you. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter. I met so many investors who told me, oh, my God, this is a graveyard of companies. Don't go into primary education. Districts are tough. They're bureaucratic. No funding right? Um, just really the worst dynamics that, um, that you might want in a business. Hey, co-founders, welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins, a podcast where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies, discussing everything from the wins and losses of entrepreneurship to the next steps after the exit. To not miss out on these exciting stories, be sure to subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. I am here with Vlada uh, Lukina. Did I say that correctly? That's right. She is the founder of Class Tag. She's also an immigrant founder and has done some fantastic and wonderful things in education and in the tech space. So I want to hand it off over to you and hear a little bit about your origin story and how you founded the business. Super. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. My story starts from Ukraine. I loved my early start as entrepreneur back in Ukraine, actually growing up alongside my dad, who's an entrepreneur. So I got to inherit that and and sort of uh, get my first um, steps as entrepreneur alongside him. And then I wanted to learn the proper way to do business, which in my book meant uh, MBA, big companies and things like that. So I applied to top three business programs, got it to Wharton in the U.S., shipped myself overseas, spent about a decade at Boston Consulting Group and climbing corporate ladder at Dell, two levels down from Michael Dell. 
then I realized that big companies actually are just a lot of people, but really entrepreneurship <laughs> is where my passion is. And that's perhaps the most honest or the most truthful way to see what you're worth, because the past steps with you, you can't really uh, rely on this large infrastructure and all the various people, resources, et cetera, that you have in a large company. And so about that time, my daughter started school in New York City. And I was receiving communications from the school. And frankly, I was shocked. It was flyers in the backpack, sign up sheets on the door. And obviously in a day and age when we know what our friends eat for breakfast on Instagram, whether we want it or not, it's crazy that you can have the same level of connectivity with your child. That brought idea of class tag, really helping parents and teachers become partners in the kids' education. And that's the platform I started with a dad in the same class. His son and my daughter were classmates. He became a CTO and I became the CEO of this uh, company. We scaled that to 5 million users, raised funding, and ultimately exited. And that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> that's a big win. Not a lot of companies exit. What was your dad doing? As an entrepreneur. So my dad actually uh, was an entrepreneur during the collapse of Soviet Union. That was the most fun time. I actually regret that I can't be entrepreneur in that time because it was really wild west. So whatever company you start, you can be the first to market. He started maybe 15 companies and they were all different, right? So one of them was producing coats. Another one was producing hats. Another one was a little cinema in an office space or apartment he was renting. Really retail, tons of stuff because you could be really on a limb with very little funding and just a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. You could be first to market with anything. Isn't that incredible? After the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were like, Real estate was open. You could be the first to market to if you opened up a mine or opened up, you said a cinema, a hat shop. His uh, brother immigrated to United States. When he visited him, he brought a DVR. I think he was one of few people in the whole city that actually had the DVR. He rented out a space. He put on the DVR with, I think it was called Police 3 or whatever that movie was. And so it kept playing and... um he had a big audience. As a kid, maybe I was selling tickets or whatever I was doing. <laughs> you were selling things when you were, you were a kid. That's a, kind of the beginning right. of an entrepreneurship, right? Yes, exactly. And I think just having that front row seat to that craziness. He was an engineer by his education who worked at the factory until you, you know, Soviet Union collapsed. And then he just went all out and doing all sorts of crazy entrepreneurial things. And it was just so fun to watch and participate in. When you look at the economic development post-Soviet Union, a big spike over seven to nine years of like just businesses being developed and then access to the global economy. Is he still an entrepreneur or did he end up selling those businesses? Did the cinema take off? Did the hat company not? Like what, what happened with this, with all these different companies that he had? Obviously, one of the things being part of a developing economy is that it's always developing and has a lot yeah. of twists and turns, even more so, right? Here we talk about COVID and how much uh, it impacted business as well in country like Ukraine, let alone what's happening now. There is a big shift and a big sort of event happening every couple of years, right? The complete right. devaluation of currency or this or that or this crisis, right? So you have to be so agile and so on your feet to run business there. So to answer your question, he um, and sort of evolved his businesses, his latest businesses in renewable energy which is sort of uh, more consistent with the times. And unfortunately, because of the war in Ukraine, it is challenging to run these businesses. My heart goes out to old entrepreneurs who continue to employ people, who continue to try and run businesses no matter what. And he and other entrepreneurs like that are my heroes, for sure. That's remarkable. I remember seeing video footage of an office. It looked like my tech office. We have the sanding desks and everything like that. And then you see footage post what happened with the war in, in Ukraine. And it doesn't look anything similar to what it looked like before. I can't imagine running a company in this environment or trying to work with customers and trying to make sure your employees are safe. Everyone is taken care of. Um, that's a scary and, and hard thought. Absolutely. And as we know, running a business is hard enough in itself. Finding yeah. a problem 
that people want to pay for and that you are differentiated in a competitive market and yada, yada, yada. And yet that's like 20% of the things that these people have to worry about. 80% is really the livelihood of the people and their safety and just so many other political factors that they need to think about beyond just the core business as we know it. My outsourcing company had a couple thousand people in the Philippines and we had the pandemic and they shut down the highways and there were safety concerns. And we were worried about how do you get people home? Did you have to navigate those type of concerns with the war in Ukraine as a founder and going through your process? Absolutely. And I still remember that day that the war started. And, you know, of course, having not only my team and family there, I was, you know, very closely following the news. I offered the team to relocate um, a couple of weeks and months before that. They said, absolutely no, nobody believed that this war is, is happening. And so the morning off, we had our all hands. And I remember all my U.S. staff messaging me saying, hey, maybe we should cancel because of what's happening. And I said, absolutely not. While folks in Ukraine are dealing with this, we just need to work harder and we have to be strong for them because as long as we run the business, as long as we accelerate our sales, that's how we can support them. We are not going to support them if we just sit here and go crazy because, yes, that's what everyone wants to do is just to paralyzing. It's so incredibly challenging to deal with it. And so we did help hold the old hands. Some of the Ukrainians actually joined, believe it or not, from underground and wherever they were hiding. And the team really pulled together. We had some operations with some other folks that were based in Europe to help connect folks to evacuation opportunities. We had a live chat to do that. And we even were singing Ukrainian an anthem with American colleagues to lift uh, up one of the employees who was hiding with her small daughter and was just not in a good place mentally. And so that lifted her up and gave her strength to run to the train station in Kiev and take that train to Poland and get to a more safe location. Are all of your employees now in safe locations? Or... Many are still in Ukraine. Yeah, they okay. didn't want to move or couldn't move because men between ages of 18 and 60, they cannot yes. leave the country unless they have three kids or some other special circumstances. Makes sense. My wife is Ukrainian and her uncle is like 63 and we're looking at the age cutoff and we're like, they could increase it to 65, you don't know. And then you're trying to figure out the logistics of how to get them over the border. And that's stressful. Anyone is prepared to deal with for sure. Absolutely not. You ended up selling class tag. Would you mind sharing about what that m &A process was like? And then what was that process like in regards to the war happening in Ukraine? I would say that before we actually sold ClassTag, we went initially through a process 18 months prior to that. As I was ra raising our Series A, we got approached to sell the business and it was a really compelling offer after a lot of deliberation. I just had to give in. The partners were flying to see me. They were calling me. And so there was just a lot of convincing happening. And so we went with that M&A offer, which meant that we locked down for that exclusivity period for maybe three months or so. And as luck or unluck <laughs> had it, we got uh, to the very last mile in that M&A process right before the war started in Ukraine. I always believe that whatever happens, happens for the best. Yeah. But at that time, I would say professionally, that was one of the toughest things I had to persevere uh, through. Uh, and that was when at the 11th hour, when I was collecting signatures from investors, the last minute negotiation about some tax treatments, those fine details on the deal, diligence was done, technology diligence, everything was done. We got on a call with them and they said, we are not going to do the deal. And I honestly, I couldn't speak for probably 48 hours. I just couldn't. It's a hard process to go through, period. I know. And I think that um, honestly, that's something I want to share with other first time entrepreneurs who are thinking about M&A or getting M&A opportunities in their inbox. 
one thing I wish I knew as a first time founder is that I think 90% of M&A deals fall apart. And I just did not know. I had no idea. Have I known the statistics? I should have raised, let's say, Series A and then got back to these folks and say, amazing, let's now have a conversation, right? And I just have a lot more cash in the bank, but we can still, you know, continue the conversation. So I think that it is really important at all times to have optionality. And as a first time entrepreneur, that actually taught me a lot about going through the process second time. And that's why it went so smoothly, right? And second time we had to, to our multiple offers. We hired an investment banker. It was a proper process with all the steps and stages in place. And then I just operated the business as if no M&A process is happening. My goal was to have a thriving business, M&A or not. I didn't care about it. In the conversations that we've been having over the past few weeks, that seems to be a common thread. Like this business needs to run and stand on its own. And if you want to buy the business and you want to partner together, great. But if not, then I'm just going to be over here doing my own thing. And there's also nothing better than being like, hey, you can also buy the business a year from now, but it's not going to be the same price and we're going to be growing. I think investors as well as potential M&A partners can kind of tell or, or, or kind of sense that if you're like, we're doing this with or without you. Exactly. And I think that first experience gave me a lot of confidence. That's the only way to go. Mm -hmm. And even in my mind, I already decided and with the board, we gained alignment that that was a plan A to actually sell the business. I knew that we are perfectly capable of plan B and yeah. that we have a thriving, profitable business that can keep going if this doesn't happen. And I think that just puts us in a whole different position in negotiation. I think so too. Like you just have to be able to walk away. Did you have a formal board that you were working with or reporting to? We did have a formal board and that was formed later on after the first M&A didn't happen. And okay. so we got a more structured governance in place for the business. It's funny that my co-founder and CTO, as I mentioned, was a dad in my daughter's class. He started a number of companies in the past and had experience with boards. He said, be careful, don't, you know, don't run, don't rush into having a formal board. Somehow we just had a good relationship, good communication with uh, investors, but we didn't have a formal board until sort of that uh, experience. Board management's kind of a skill that no one talks about, but how to make sure that the board is an advocate for you and, and can help you with the process. Do you feel like that was part of the difference between the first process and the second one? There were a difference was investment banker. And so that okay, also yeah. took some pressure off me as the, the only eyes and ears on the front lines of what what's really happening. And as a more independent party, I think that it also, we had a pretty substantial cap table with over 30 investors. The fact that we had a few major investors on the board allowed for that representation and effective communication. Overall, I've been really blessed with very supportive investors. Many of them were founders in the past. Some of them were really experts in education and so really cared about the mission as well as um, the outcome financially as well. Just uh, really thrilled to have shared this journey with some amazing people. Hey listeners, a year ago, I started working with Taylor Robinson Music, a go-to place for people that are looking to learn any instrument, whether it's a garage band or band and orchestra. They have a network of over 10,000 different instructors. They have locations around the United States. Check them out. Cheers. How has it been after the deal went through? How are how are you doing and what are some of the things that, that make you excited? The second time I was operating as if I'm not selling the business, when yeah. I sold it, I didn't feel anything, to be honest. I didn't even feel that I sold it because I kept, I kept going on that momentum. And so um, I would say the first few months were actually really busy because of the integration and how critical the role of class tech is in the ecosystem of other companies as part of this strategic acquisition. And so I wanted to make sure that my team is properly integrated and gets opportunity for growth. I wanted to make sure that the platform 
is well understood and so it lands well and we have uh, millions of users in the platform. That was important to me as well. And I was busy just with that whole process. And so until three days ago that I'm officially not part of the acquiring company, I actually didn't feel like I've exited beyond just the fact that I financially feel much more secure. Congratulations on the actual exit. And then this like almost secondary wave of exit right. um, over the past three days, what have you been feeling? Excited about um, opportunities and excited about the world of possibilities. It's so fun to feel like, you know, you don't have 50 things on your plate. And I know a lot of founders go through the downs of it um, and, and sort of um, maybe because of this delayed uh, exit in my mind, I didn't feel it. I I, I feel great. I feel excited for what's next. I love connecting with other entrepreneurs and dreaming up what the future holds. Let's talk about that. What are some things that are exciting to you? As I reflect on my experience, um, effectively what I have expertise in is management consulting, which I've done decades of, and uh, being a founder over the remaining eight years of my uh, professional career. And if you blend the two, it's it's really, I think, lends itself well with coaching and supporting other entrepreneurs. I am very passionate about idea of product market fit and focusing in on what's working and untangling that signal, right? And I think as a founder, I found that hard to do because you have a lot of things that sort of are working and then you end up with a multi-layered key that is really hard to untangle over time rather than figuring out where the signal is, where is that persona and how to go pursue it. And I have as a, a immigrant founder, have a soft spot for immigrant founders. And so I've been spending a lot of time supporting immigrant founders who want to enter U.S. market. Perhaps they have a business that they want to bring to U.S. or folks that on the contrary are looking at international expansion. That's something that I don't think U.S. businesses spend enough time thinking about, and there is a whole world out there. I honestly think it's fantastic because I get really excited whenever I hear about a company taking something that either works in one market and taking it to another one. You hear about Rocket Internet, and they take Amazon, and they're like, I'm going to take this to the Philippines, and it's going to be called Lazada. You can do that, and then you can also do the reverse and say, like, hey, this is really working uh, well in Portugal, and we can, it doesn't exist here. And it kind of creates its own moat, right? Because you already know it's a proven idea. Have you seen any good examples of this or any cool other immigrant founders or companies that are doing this really well? That have done that transition? Um, yeah. That's a good question. Um, I um, I certainly know some, but they wouldn't be big names as of yet, right? So there are early days in, in entering the market, specifically the few founders I'm working with are from Latin America or Europe at the moment. And I think especially in this world where the world is uh, taking over by AI a bit by bit, right? I think yeah. what's deeply human is that culture, as you said, your origin story. And I think as you talk about sort of cultural differences and things like that, there are a lot of really cool businesses that can transport that culture and that flavor, uh, but also um, a lot of great opportunities to just scale a proven idea in one market and figure out where else you can go, creating just a tremendous opportunity for growth. In college, we had a program called Isaac, which was like an international exchange of young people. So they can go work cool. for like PwC in like Mexico City or or. Uh, Coke in Korea and like you have that international exchange of like young people and ideas. You could hire people in your city, but you can also find the best talent if you were to search nationally and even more if you were to go internationally. It's like a no brainer. Did you have that experience? Because I know you have ties to Ukraine and your team was international. Did you find that was like a unique differentiator and had an impact on you? Absolutely. And I think from day one, we decided it will be fully remote. So we were fully remote before remote became a thing and the forced transition. And so we had support team in Philippines. We had development team and product team in Ukraine. We had folks in all sorts of odd places from Singapore to Portugal to UK, just because we found great talent in those locations. In the US, they were also spread out across the country. And I think as long as you have great communication mechanisms and a way to build 
culture around the core team, it becomes really fun. I know for a fact that a number of American colleagues who joined Plastag, they were saying, oh my God, I joined this company. You're only 40 people, but you have 40 countries <laughs> in this one place, right? That's so fun. Um, what were some things that made your experience a little different when you were launching your business as an immigrant founder versus, um, say, someone that um, grew up here and, and probably had a different experience than you did? It might sound strange, but I only recently realized that I'm an immigrant founder <laughs> because I didn't think of myself as such, right? And so as I was building the business, I was just building it. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you get 100 no's for every yes and, you know, just keep going with it. And only recently when I started talking to founders and they say, well, you know, as an immigrant founder, how do I start? How do I do this? And, you know, how do I build a network? And that actually opened my eyes and said, gosh, I am an immigrant founder. I think there are a lot of labels, right? Female tech founder, immigrant tech founder, whatever other things. Yes. And, and there are biases and there are some barriers and all of this stuff is true. But I just feel that it's not helpful to put that label on myself and then say that I can't do something because of that label when, in fact, all I need to do is to embrace my strengths. So I'd rather focus on my unique, I, I don't know, accent, if you will, or I don't know, sense of humor or whatever else there is that differentiates me rather than things that hold me back. How remarkable is like your background too and like what your dad went through and in the Soviet Union when he was launching, you got to see someone launch 12 businesses instead of one. Right. That's not a normal experience. It's a special one. And so right. I think there's something to celebrate there for sure. When you were talking about helping founders and helping pay it forward, I think it would be fun to have almost like an accelerator where you're like, hey, you have a great business here in Uruguay. Let's like look at bringing it here to the States and we'll help you with connections and distribution channels and vendors and stuff like that. There's definitely something there where I think it, it would be a fun project. That's in line with what, with what I'm thinking and, and starting to test out. So if you're an international founder listening to this, reach out. I think that with the kind of push for remote culture, it opens up a lot of channels and opportunities for international companies to expand their reach and who they work with. Are you seeing any of that in your company and, and some of the companies that you're working with? That they're reaching out as, as distributors? Yeah, and it's easier to enter markets almost. Like it's easier to hire people in the Philippines than it was before. And vice versa, it's easier for Philippines companies to enter the American market because if you are working with the companies on the back end or if you're launching a product, you can enter a market that you can previously enter if you didn't have a physical presence there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the reality is that, especially in the software space, right, every business in a way is a global business, whether you want it or not. So for example, when we launched Class Tag, I remember there was an article in Greece and all of a sudden we got 10,000 Greek users overnight. And I was like, <laughs> damn it, like we are not, you know, we, we didn't count on it. We didn't go through GDPR. So we just closed it that same day. It was like, no, we can't have, have uh, EU users, but you never know, right? Your stuff is out there and yeah. an article can be written and all of a sudden you have a business in a new place. And of course, I think the whole mantra is to be proactive, right? To proactively look for those opportunities uh, in, in different uh, geographies and to enter. But the reality is, especially in software business, you can have 10,000 Greek users any day. That's pretty awesome. How did you scale class tag to 5 million people? That's a lot of users. I still remember that moment when I would travel and or talk to other parents and they're like, oh my God, I'm using it or my friend teacher is using it, et cetera. And so I think when you reach that number pretty much anywhere in, in the country uh, or in Greece, as we learned, <laughs> you can meet uh, those users. And so it's really fun. But how we scaled was the first hundred users by hand. I interviewed a lot of parents, had teachers of their kids. And so I got those hundred users effectively in New York City, where I lived at the time. And then from there, we started really scaling through that early advocacy group of these hundred teachers. And maybe that's how we got to about a thousand teachers when they started inviting others. And what's cool about teachers, as well as a lot of vertical SaaS solutions, is when people like something, they will share, right? And mm -hmm. so 
a lot of our messaging and marketing was teachers sharing with other teachers, whether that was actual advertising of teachers talking about it or um, or webinars of teachers, but it was always teacher to teacher as the central idea of the marketing. And then from there, just started scaling it with <clears throat> amplifying some paid advertising for the back to school, which was the most cost effective time to to scale before school year starts. So you weren't selling into the school districts and like the principals and stuff like that, right? In my early days of um, fund fundraising for Class Tag, I met so many investors who told me, oh my God, this is a graveyard of companies. Don't go into primary education. Districts are tough. They're bureaucratic. No funding, right? Um, just really the worst um, the dynamics that, um, that you might want in a business. That lesson was so ingrained in my head that... I avoided so selling to districts until they started coming to us. Like, they started coming to us when we had enough sort of critical math, but we also had COVID, which was a big catalyst for digitalization of communication and the importance of community building in, in schools and in, in public education in, in America. We started getting inbound from these districts and that's a much easier way to sell. <laughs> Did you see a massive lift when COVID went through? Yeah, so it was really interesting because of our model, which was bottom up, right? Sort of teachers adopting it in their classroom. The day COVID happened in that week, it was spreading like wildfire. My cell phone didn't stop because my the teachers were calling me and begging to let them use class tag because their schools and districts basically told them, we can't, right? We need to be in control. We need to be in charge. We need to have this system. And so they were finding my cell phone to to ask for help. It's like, can you call oh, my wow, district? Yeah. I want to use your platform. They're not letting me do something. And I was like, I can't really help you unless you actually go to your district and tell them to call me. Then I can help you and sell them the platform for, for their whole district. And so that what started that whole inbound. So in a way, short term, it brought our users down, but then it brought them up from the enterprise side. Did you see the uh, pods like where teachers were spinning out and taking, say, like six to nine students and they were doing pretty well, like they were making more money working with fewer students directly um, than they were in the public school system? I think that's what's happening in education is that it, it a lot of things just didn't go back to the old normal, right? There is a new right, normal right. in education. And so there are virtual schools now, right? So for example, my daughter says, hey, I actually don't like how the you know geometry is taught. I want a virtual option. Apparently public schools today offer virtual options, right? I, who knew, right? Before COVID, I don't think that was a possibility. Then you have a homeschooling that is on the rise and a huge trend. You have these small schools that are popping up across the whole country. And in fact, there are so many interesting entrepreneurial opportunities in that kind of homeschooling, kind of small, uh, semi-private space that are really amazing. So it, it is, education is one of those laggy laggards that yeah, takes a sure. long time to change, but it is going through quite a bit of transformation. I hope it does change a little bit because I feel like if you have access to the best professors or the best teachers in the world, you can't go back to doing it the same way. I also feel like there's a little bit of a shift towards like practical education. It makes me happy whenever I see entrepreneurs on like TikTok or YouTube and they're showing kids like, here's how you like change a tire. Here's how you change out a breaker and your breaker board. And I think that's amazing. 100%. And I think that as I reflect on sort of the skills that I actually find practical in life and the skills that I was taught in schools, I, like all of us, I think I find those diverging quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. And take it some practical skills, like you mentioned, or how to manage money, what money is, right? Personal finance. I don't know. Nobody teaches that, but do you have a lot, if you have a little money or a lot of money, you still know, know, need to know how to manage it regardless. And that's not a subject. Yeah, the fact that you go through 18 years and uh, then you're expected to pay taxes, but that no one thought, oh, maybe that should be a class on mm -hmm. how you actually do that. It's, right. it's shocking. So on your side, as a, a mother of a daughter, 
what are you thinking? What's going through your head whenever she's she's going through this and how are you going to help her? I actually have been really open about my entrepreneurial journey. And I think she likes to joke that I'm the least engaged parent who started a parent engagement platform. Oh, ouch. <laughs> Which, thankfully, there are not that many parents, but uh, she's, um, you know, she's she is sarcastic and we have beautiful, very close relationship with her. I think in a lot of ways, she is proud of uh, of the things I've done. She also has seen the sacrifice that it took to to get mm -hmm. to where where I gotten and we do have very, I would say, a very open and advanced conversation. So the other day she was asking me about taking companies public and stock and how does it work? And if she buys one stock versus index funds and something because she heard me talking about it. So I don't know that many parents necessarily talk to their kids about it, but she's listening to what I talk about and she's asking me questions. And I think there is a lot of learning that can happen through, through that experience and that sharing. Hey, podcast listeners, if you guys are interested in cold email outbound outreach that actually works or thought leadership and how to build a community around some of the things that you're working on, I highly recommend incendiumstrategies.com. They're not just sponsoring this podcast, but they're also helping us with a lot of the communities that we run on the back end. Uh, so if that's something that resonates with you guys and you're interested in learning more, check out incendiumstrategies.com. Thank you guys. And back to the pod. I wanted to ask you about uh, CEO Unboxed. What's the premise? So you're launching a, a podcast. You also have videos that are coming out. What's the focus? I really wanted to put the spotlight on a person and yeah. knowing that a lot of times entrepreneurs put the spotlight on a company and say, oh, my company scaled. My company did this. It solved that problem. But not your company did that. You did that, right? And in parallel, you had your own journey to be a better leader, to cope with whatever personal things you had to cope with and adjust, right? And, and persevere and go through all these crazy roller coasters, which is called entrepreneurship. And so that's what CEO Unbox is about, is really talking about lessons learned about personal qualities, uh, perseverance, um, life lessons, and sort of sharing and imparting that wisdom for other entrepreneurs. So raw, unfiltered stories of CEOs behind company headlines. Has there been some good takeaways from the first uh, 10 episodes? Yes. Um, huh. Um, no journey is easy. Yeah. Every journey is full of twists and turns. I think what I've been really pleasantly surprised by is a lot of entrepreneurs that I'm interviewing are either exited entrepreneurs or they've scaled their company substantially to this point. And people are really humble. I don't know if there is self-selection there, but it's been a really enjoyable to see how people understand the mistakes they've made. Yeah. And in a way that doesn't make them feel silly or lose confidence in whatever they're doing, but in a really mature way, talk about the mistakes and missteps and how they would do things differently in a very open way. And I think in a lot of ways, I find that folks that sold their businesses somehow just have the benefit of that reflection period that you just don't have as someone who is grinding every day you have more space, right? You go talk to people, you tell your story. And so that's, um, I think that there is a lot to learn fr from those folks because they just spend time reflecting. And I think that self-reflection is perhaps I found to be the most challenging skill to develop, but it's also the most rewarding skill to allow you to grow. It's humbling uh, running a company and then even selling a company because then your identity is broken off and you're trying to figure out who you are next. Um, so it's, I think there's a little bit of that too. I think whenever I talk to younger entrepreneurs, they're all, and there's this bravado there that okay. it's like, I'm going up and to the right. I, everything is great. And then you hear back from them and then the company doesn't exist the next, next week. And you're like, oh, what happened? It was all great until it fell off a cliff. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And, and whenever you get to the point where you've sold a business or sold multiple businesses, you've seen how it can go wrong. And you're just grateful that you were able to navigate it around all the corners and bends to make it to where you were. And, re and remain composed, right? No, right. no, no matter what. That's, that's a pretty big shift, right? And your anxieties are different. Your anxieties go from like, oh, I have employees I'm responsible for and, 
and I have to like sell this product and sell the service and launch this to, um, you don't have as many meetings. You don't, you aren't as responsible for as many employees, but you have anxiety as to like, maybe what do I do next or family or personal anxieties or, or monetary anxieties. Um, and so it's just different. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other thing about entrepreneurs is after you worked so, so hard, it, it's also really hard to not do it, right? Get yeah. into a whole new routine. And when your calendar might not be filled up with meetings and you're like, oh, what do I do? Do I just read a book leisurely or what? what, what's, what's there? But I do think that I haven't really honestly taken a, like a proper vacation yet. <laughs> I'm, that's something I'm looking forward to doing this summer for a longer period. But I do think that just slowing down a bit is really important because that allows you for that reflection, but also not, not going off the grid entirely for me, because I know that would set off some other anxieties about why am I not being productive? Why I'm not doing this? And and so I think that there is this happy medium for me about sparkling the ideas and having kind of enough momentum to to think and grow, but also just allowing myself to kind of slow down. You don't relax too much. <laughs> <laughs> you relax just enough and you stay in the pocket. Um, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Uh, where should people go to find you? I am fairly active on LinkedIn, so you can find me by Vlada Lotkina there. I'm um, broadcasting CEO Unboxed Live, various other sessions. I recently launched a newsletter as well. It's called uh, Founders Elevator, specifically focused on product market fit, go-to-market scaling, and other entrepreneurial subjects that I'm particularly passionate about and sharing some tested and proven strategies on that front. That's fantastic. I'm going to include the links below. Uh, Vlada, fantastic to have you. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter. You're telling people like, our company's doing great. Our website looks amazing. We're growing really fast. All the you know BS you tell your investors. And then behind the scenes, let's be honest, you're an entrepreneur. Everything is on fire. Hey, co-founders, welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins, a podcast where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies, discussing everything from the wins and losses of entrepreneurship to the next steps after the exit. To not miss out on these exciting stories, be sure to subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, I'm here with Adam Spector. He is the founder of Levy. He started four companies, Abstract Ops, uh, Virtue, and Lift Igniter. Um, and you also have your own podcast, the Entrepreneurial Excellence Podcast. That's my speech impediment coming out. And now I'm doing a podcast. So this is wonderful for childhood me. How are you doing, Adam? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to have you. So we run similar companies in the past. So Levy and Support Ninja are kind of a, a little bit hand to hand, right? We're looking at how do you leverage and how do you buy back your time? How did you get back on that that kick? Did you have an EA and uh, you just kind of fell in love with this idea of, of scaling and, and hiring people to do some things possibly better than you um, could in that specific area? How did you how did you get into this space? Yeah, so I actually got into space mostly because I realized there was a, a kind of unique need. And I just started noticing all these companies I had the real pleasure of investing in and privilege of investing in and the company that I started, I was always the business guy dealing with all this back office work. And it felt like every single time I was reinventing the wheel, yet it wasn't different for any company. It wasn't as if my SaaS company versus my machine learning company versus all these ones were all that different. They basically had the same problems and I had to rebuild a whole playbook. How do I do hiring? How do I do offboarding, onboarding, compliance, equity, all these different pieces. And the idea of recreating that wheel felt totally insane especially my time, you only have 24 hours a day. And of course, a good amount of that you need to sleep and eat and do other things with life. And then you have to think through as a founder, is my time better spent doing back office work to run the business, which isn't differentiating. It's not why I'm going to get my next high valuation and markup in my next round of fundraising. Is it working building product and delighting my customers? Is it going to market or other things? And in the end, when you break that apart, to me, someone needs to solve this. It's not sexy. I call Levy we're like the plumbers of businesses, it, it's get, it gets really nasty when your plumbing breaks and everything stops, right? And you got to call plumber ASAP. 
it's kind of the same thing with Levy. And I was like, we need to solve this. It's not sexy, but it needs to be done. I've heard that, like it not being a sexy industry, because essentially it's outsourcing and it's to your point, plumbing and back office support. I talked to some other entrepreneurs and, oh, you're the outsourcing guy. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, that's such a sexy business. And I'm like, that's not what I heard. Uh, to their point, they probably see this as an international company uh, most of the time, right? And you're you're working with a bunch of really cool people and you're building these remote teams. And so they had a different point of view than I did. I thought it was funny that what I thought was originally an uncool niche space is now something that people are actually looking at and they're thinking it's a cool business. Putting myself in their shoes without knowing, of course, who they are. What I find most cool yeah. about any business is the companies that can scale and grow and build something successful. That is, to me, the most sexy thing. I actually don't care almost what industry you're in, and it might seem sexy on the surface. What's sexy is building a business that grows and succeeds and creates real delight for your customers. Why do you become an entrepreneur? You become an entrepreneur because you want to solve a need that exists in the market and that you think will make the lives of other people better. And whatever the space is, in some ways, it doesn't matter. To be a restaurant, people need another pizza place. Maybe that's what you think is going to change the world in its own small way, which is great. Building that into a success means you've solved the problem. That's winning, the exciting part that creates real value. And so who cares if it's because you're doing the hard stuff sitting in a windowless conference room in the Philippines? You've solved for a real need. There is a little bit of a, an adrenaline rush, right? Whenever you're like, oh, I solved that problem. And then you move over to the next one and you're like, I solved that problem, right? And then whenever the, the problems feel overwhelming, that's whenever you have a bad day. And, oh, geez, I don't know how to move forward. I'm usually worried whenever I don't know what the next move is. And so if I always know what the next move is, then usually I'm, I'm all right because I'm able to make 5% improvement on each department month over month that adds up to a snowball, that adds up to a bigger company. That, that, that's what flow feels like for me. Do you get a rush whenever you, you're solving problems inside your company and you're like, oh, I made this department just a smidge better? I do. And I actually talk about this with my team on a regular basis is the idea of, hey, like how, how do we plan for a long-term successful future? And how do we realize that every day we're compounding? I, I, I'm a huge believer in just the idea of compounding. In, in every single step we take forward, we're building on top of it. We're getting stronger. It doesn't happen overnight. We all like to right. see these overnight successes and there's big stories about Facebook and how they took off. But like the truth is, most of them are, are a little bit like SpaceX or Tesla or something where it's, man, they almost died. And a million little improvements every single day to get there. That's what a real business is about. And that is, that, that's fun and sexy, even if you can't see it immediately. We were talking about the cost of having a wrong hire and how mm -hmm. detrimental that is. Um, but I view compounding almost on the other side of it, where I made a right hire. And over time, I build up the right people in the right seat. And then you have this amazing community of people that you've hired over time and I'm able to progress. And that's something that's like a unique differentiator in the right moat is, is really like one person can be a game changer to, to your work. How did you grow the business and get that excitement and knowing what you're going to do each day? Was it just your willingness to put one step in front of the neck? I don't have the answers, but I'm going to figure it out. Cause you kept, you kept it going for a long time as support ninja to get to, to, to an exit, what were the steps to get yourself through those tough times, the difficult moments where you didn't know the answer? The main thing is that you have to run the business like you're going to be running it forever, right? You can't go in with the mindset that this is going to end. And so the main thing is like, how do you want to be spending your time? What type of problems do you want to be solving? Which type of people do you want to be solving those problems with? And for me, that's how I get good days is I, I get a little bit of an adrenaline kick whenever I see the right people in the right seat interacting in really cool ways I never thought and making stuff that I never thought could be possible, let alone something I could do on my own. And so I think that's why I focus so much on incremental improvement, right? Is like, how do I make this 5% better? And I think you probably get a little bit of that whenever you're helping companies with their back office support, right? You're helping them with that incremental improvement. It, it's actually our mission in many ways. We think the world is a better place when there are more successful entrepreneurs. Yeah. Because all those entrepreneurs are trying to solve a problem so the more of them that we can help and get out there to do that with is a win for society. And, and we are a part of that journey. And, and frankly, I think a pretty big way, but it's pretty special. I mean, you, they're inviting you to help them scale the back end of their company. So you get to see them in a very unique way and you get to help out with something that's pretty, pretty important, pretty key. How is Levy going so far? You guys have been growing for the past couple of years. What are some things that are on the horizon that you're excited about? People actually 
let us see the real vulnerable side. And you're telling people, our company's doing great. Our website looks amazing. We're growing really fast. All the you know BS you tell your investors. And then behind the scenes, like let's be honest, you're an entrepreneur. Like everything is on fire. And we see that. We're here to tame that fire and get things under control. We can't guarantee you're going to have a great product. We can't guarantee you're going to go to market the right way. But man, we can guarantee that you're going to make sure your team's going to get paid on time. You're not going to have major fines. When you get your next fundraise, you're going to be in really good shape for that. And, and you can go on to the next date and save yourself a ton of money on lawyers and nothing else. Um, so, but anyways, um, to answer the question, yeah, no, like Levy, Levy is kind of an interesting story. So um, we've actually only been around for about a year and a half. Um, and we, uh, we spun out in a sense, not legally spun out, but spun out of my last company called Abstract Ops. Abstract Ops was started with the explicit goal of automating back office tasks. No one had ever done that before. It was difficult to do. It's still difficult to do. But we, while we raised about $10 million for Abstract Ops, it turns out, certainly when the markets start getting bad, which they were into the spring of 2022 or so, people are not that willing to fund businesses that look a lot like services companies. I could argue for a bunch of reasons that's probably wrong and they're making a mistake, but I understand why VCs at least don't want to do that. It was hard for us to raise. And we said, okay, we have a business that, a software business that's going okay, but we might need to make some changes there. And we have the services business that's kind of a break-even business right now. We haven't invested in it in a big way. We did it for other reasons why we have that. And so we essentially decided to split up the company. In October of 2022 was the official sort of first day of levy. We were seven people with a break-even business. We're now a year and a half later, about 30 people. We want to be more profitable, and, but it's grown <laughs> pretty well from that point forward. So, so it's far to go, but it's gone decently. There's not a lot of people that have spun out a business of a, an existing business. You have to figure out like which assets are on which side of the fence. How did you negotiate that? Really good question. And you're right. It's very rare. I think our investors say, I think we're the only ones that have, they've seen it happen successfully. And actually, I'll add, by the way, my co-founder, even though we had a lot of contentious negotiations, because of course I didn't want them to. So they own a small portion of Levy, right. Abstract Ops, my last company, because we essentially took all their contracts. So that was a trade-off. It was contentious, of course, negotiations about how much they should own, things like that. But to his credit and mine, of course, too, it takes two to tango. We both came at it from a perspective of we're playing long-term games. And our perspective is I'm okay with maybe giving up a little bit here or there on the margins to preserve a relationship and keep this going for the long term because our joint success is more important than a slightly better win on a slightly higher ownership perspective. And we actually had a fund together. We've increased doing that fund. So we have our own VC fund together. We invest together all the time. We talk oh, nice. on Slack multiple yeah. times a week still, um, all those sorts of things. But it really was coming from that, pers from that perspective of, we're playing long-term games and our goal is to do work together and build things that are wonderful for the long-term, not for some small short-term gain. Life isn't about that. If you don't mind, Adam, give a high-level timeline of the four companies that you started and what was the outcome. And if you feel comfortable sharing some of the numbers as far as like uh, employees or revenue size that you guys were able to scale to, um, that stuff is really helpful, if not completely understand. My journey started when I came out to Silicon Valley in 2010, I always wanted to be here. I found it fascinating. And I just wanted to be in the tech space. Like I, you could plot me even today in Hollywood and famous people would walk by me and I'd have no idea who they are at all. But if I saw like Elon Musk or saw Jeff Bezos or um, Sergey Brin or people like that, I'd be like, holy shit, like you are the rock star that I look up to. Um, and I wanted to be in Silicon Valley. So I, I got lucky enough to, I was working at a tech company in DC, which is where I'm from. I just finished my JD MBA, I work in the strategy team won a bunch of awards there. It was all going great. I mean, I could have stayed a long time, but I actually will never forget. I remember asking the HR team, I was like, hey, look, how do I get to my manager's position? He was a senior manager. And I knew it would take some time, but they basically were like, it's going to take about 20 years. And, then I like, I like, and you're I like, okay, thanks. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, okay. So, and I literally actually even, even <laughs> called him out. I was like, so wait, I was at a tech company in DC, but it wasn't a place for me. And, and actually another big point I had there too, you know, this is going to get to your question specifically, but I sat down with a, a founder of a Sequoia back company in DC, which is pretty rare back then and still today. And that founder, I asked him, I got lucky enough to get the intro to him. And, I, and he basically, he gave me really good advice, which obviously has stuck with me today. He said, look, if you want to be in politics, stay in DC. This is the place for politics. Be here. This, you're going to play, play at the, the highest levels with best. Test yourself against them. If you want to be in finance, go to New York. Go play in finance world and go against the best there. If you want to be in media, go to LA. 
go do that with the best there. But if you want to be in tech, go to the Bay Area. He, so he's a tech founder in DC and he's like, go to the Bay Area, be in tech there. Um, and so that was the advice I took. I said, okay, well, I can't stay at my current job. This doesn't make sense for me long term. I'm going to head west. So I did. Got how long have you been in CF or SF? For, how long 14 have you been years. 14, 14 years, years in, in San Francisco the whole time. So my first job was actually in Mountain View, but I okay. was a young guy and I wanted to be in San Francisco where the fun stuff was happening. So right. I, um, I took Caltrain. I wasn't, it wasn't at Google. So I was taking Caltrain, uh, which is the, for those who don't know, the train down from, from San Francisco or up and down the, the kind of um, the 101 down in Mountain View. And then I'd take another train to the office and I'd walk to the office and I'd get there and be there all day. And it was awesome. It was a company called Clearwell Systems. 18 months later, it got acquired for almost 400 million, obviously because of my work. No, I'm, I'm joking. I remember that my paid from that, from my equity that I own was like enough for a small car. And I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. This is like what I'm here for. Yeah. And this is what it's about. And we built something really cool. And I was a small little part of that, but that's amazing. Um, and, and so we got, got acquired. I needed to stick around and, and do work for that, for the acquiring company, which was Semantic and then started my first company. That's fantastic. And a lot of employees don't get to see an exit happen. I'm in Dallas. So I guess that means I should get into like oil rigs and stuff like that. Or Probably that you're not. And you've done fine without that. But yeah, I would argue like if you want to be in tech, like I think that's still the case today. If you want to be, certainly if you want to be in AI, San Francisco is a place to be. The ecosystem pushes people to learn more, talk more, interact. You can do things that you can't do when you're located elsewhere. I had a moment when I was in San Francisco, I was waiting for a train or something like that to pick me up from the airport and someone was here's my tech company here's my card and that, I, that moment just kind of sticks with me i'm like where where else would do you find that that kind of experience hey podcast listeners we are currently looking for sponsors for this podcast if you guys are looking to connect with other business owners that are scaling and growing their company and you guys are interested in a spot on this podcast uh, we're looking for you so reach out to connertompkeys.com or operatorequity.com and we're glad to help set you guys up with a spot on this podcast. All right. Cheers. Back to the pod. Adam, tell me about, you started your, your first company. What was that like? What was the, what was the company? Yeah. What did it do? So this was the early days of what was called collaborative consumption. It was basically the sharing economy. And it was like, I'm going to share, I have all these tools in my shed and I can share them with someone else and rent them out. And then that became, I'm going to rent out my car and maybe drive my car around a la Uber. And actually funny story there, I was at a, a fleet week event at an entrepreneur's house over in the Marina, which is the other side of San Francisco. And this guy was there and he lived on the side of the city where I was on. And so he offered to give me a ride back. And we talked about his company, which happened to be Uber. He was the, I think, CEO of Uber at the time. He gave me a ride back. <laughs> Years later, I was like, oh my God, I should have, I clearly should have just like stopped what I was doing immediately and jumped ship and joined him on these crazy idea of building Uber. But that was the early days of the sharing economy. Lyft was getting started. I sat down with Logan Green and, and his co-founder, like, um, uh, uh, John Zimmer, for a coffee and talking about how they would use my company. So I started this company saying, how do we verify that we know who you are? How can I trust Connor? That's one of those questions. Like, back then, people thought it was crazy. You, you're going to get in some random person's car. Yeah, and there's and like safety like, risk involved. Uh, you're getting in a random cab driver's car. Like, well, it's very, you know, they did background checks or something like that. I don't know what people's excuses were. It was insane. And so we were trying to build a company that would use essentially data exhaust, which you could get off of these social networks like Facebook and other places to say Connor worked at these companies. I know Connor went to this school, essentially an, an alternative background check. And so that was virtue.us. So we were virtuous. Um, and that was the, that was the idea. That's an awesome idea. And. Well, I think most people know Checker, or maybe they do, or maybe they don't, but that's a really big company. And it went through Y Combinator and they do the background checks for Uber and Lyft. Virtue, we had real trouble selling the virtual background checks in a sense of so based on your data exhaust. We had a cool algorithm, it worked, but we just had trouble getting that really sold. We actually started doing background checks. Actually started to get a real traction in the business. It was going well, things were happening. And we ended up running out of steam. We almost sold the company and we missed out on probably a good amount of money because of it. And why we didn't sell it, but we ran out of steam is what it came down to. And so we shut the company down. But four months later, I, I happened to be, in a sense, participating in some of the, the YC Demo Day stuff. Checker showed up and I was like, holy shit, yes, this is exactly <laughs> right. I wish I had been doing that because we basically were building that. But right. I was in the seed round from Demo Day at YC in Checker, Checker's round. So, um, you know, I, you, you I got back my own into company. it in a way, right? <laughs> yeah. But because I knew it, I was like, yes, this is going to be a big industry that needs to be disrupted. I knew that I had a special insight 
And I was able then to invest in, once again, I'd rather be the founder, but it's still not bad to be an early seed investor in a, a very big successful company at this point. That's a great place to be in. And Support Ninja powered Checker back in the day and still does. And they're one of the oldest clients. And so processing those background checks and making sure that everyone is like um, kind of meeting the requirements. Do you feel like you possibly went a little niche and you were focusing on like, what is this thing that no one else has? It's this, this like other information that's coming off these data platforms. When if you had gone for the simpler answer of just making background checks a little bit more approachable for companies, then maybe it would have been a different story. Now, with that said, we didn't know what we didn't know at the time, to be clear, right? I had no idea what it was. This seemed like a need. So the market had to pull us there. The question then became, do we have the energy and time? And I remember my co-founder at the time, and he was an early Google guy, amazing engineer. He was, I'm not excited about doing background checks. Like, that's not sexy. You know what gets and me fired up in the morning? Background checks. That was the problem. It, it didn't get him excited. And so yeah, it, it wasn't something he wanted to go build out. And that, that led to a point where we didn't have the steam to keep going and, and doing it. Were you guys both in the same place as far as being mentally burnt out? Or was it more on one side? Not burned out per se, but we were both, do we want to keep pushing this? Are we going to be able to raise for this? What does right. this look like as the next iteration? So we started actually having conversations about selling the company. We had a, um, in sort of aqua hire, not full offer, but close to that with Okta at the time, which has of course become big business. And we sat down with their CEO, all these other things like they were trying to court us in another same conversation with my co founder at the time. He basically was like, if, if we could all. Like if we do the alternative, like if we just say, we're going to shut the company down, or we're going to go work and do other things. Would Okta be the place we decide to apply to and go work? And we decided no. And I think that was a huge mistake. And actually what I tell people nowadays, I say, you know what? Even if the company isn't the place you want to go work, go get that exit. I don't care if it's a massive exit. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Go Once go you get, get that first resume. one, it feels completely different. You approach business completely different. But we didn't know that. Yeah. I was a foolish young first time founder. I had no idea. And, and so we missed out on that. And, and obviously not only would it have turned out to be very lucrative because I think their stock was like $2 a share at the time. And I don't know what they're at right now. Let's call it 200 or something dollars a share after a bunch of split, you know, many, many, many splits. Um, it would have been lucrative financially. It just would have been really good for, for growth. Now, I'm not complaining. I've done well. well yeah, we learned from that, that experience and there's probably a direct line from that one to your next one. And then it continues to where you are now. So it's hard to regret yes. something that, that kind of leads to where you're happy with the outcome. We built a omni-channel kind of like backend that collects stuff from like the web app and SMS and all these different things before Zendesk was a thing. And we weren't sure how to use this technology. We weren't able to find pro product market fit and we were struggling on making margin on top of other services and APIs that weren't making margin. And it's, oh, if I could go back and do that again, like I would do things differently or I would, I would be able to sell it more effectively, but you don't even know that selling's an option. Like you're just kind of like, at least for me, I was like, oh, you have to be a, a pretty big company to have interest. I didn't even know what the process looked like. Like there's no like a pamphlet that people give you saying, Hey, this is something that you should really read before you start the startup. You just see it shark tank and you're like, I need to be pitching. I need to raise money. I need to do some of these things that might have the same impact as just having another entrepreneur that has gone through it and tell you like, Hey, this is, this is roughly the entrepreneur, uh, life cycle of well, starting a business and selling business. On that note, I think what I, I didn't do enough of, I should have asked a lot more people for advice and really mm -hmm. try to sit down and get that advice. And, and nowadays you can of course go and find lots of podcasts like this one to have that conversation and learn about it and just do some searches to find your answers, but just really spending some time. You're talking about the fate of your company and, and in a sense. The, the next big steps in your career, having those discussions and having someone who just said, no, like you have an opportunity to go sell to a fast growing company. Who cares what they're doing? Go sell, get that job. Even if you leave a day after you get the aqua hire and you lose out on the equity you were supposed to get. So what? Like you've still done it. You've still done it. And that's a stepping stone to the next thing. So you didn't sell. What was the next thing? We shut it down. Did you uh, go straight into finding a nine to five job or did you... Uh... Did you have a list of ideas that you were pretty excited about? I didn't have a list of ideas. It's one of those things where when you're working really hard to build a successful company and you have people you have to let go and all that other stuff, it's draining. It's tough. And so I needed a little bit of a break, but somewhat thereafter, I ended up becoming COO of a friend's company that was growing pretty well. It was a hardware company. 
during that process, I actually told him at the time, this isn't a full-time thing for me, but I'll come in and help you out for a few years, for a few months. During that, I started getting more into the idea, like machine learning was just starting, like in a, in a funny way. I, I was really, really early to that, that space. And, and, you know, and another thing, had I stuck with it, I would be an AI guy today. And that's what I would be known for. Um, and, you know, have a company that's worth many billions of dollars or something. Uh, but, and, but anyways, but so like really early days, I actually got introduced to a engineer who was one of the, the main guys who wrote the early Google YouTube al algorithms for personalization. And YouTube was really, from what I understand, I think still today, I think that's still true and accurate. Um, really with the first large time where machine learning was put to bear on a large data set for real-time personalization. So many people even today probably don't fully realize when you turn on YouTube, that page loads and it is fully personalized for you. It is going to be different for what Connor sees, what Adam sees, completely different. And it's loading in real time, right? It seems like it's immediate to you. There are actually milliseconds that are happening behind the scenes. They're deciding what are the hottest videos, what's most relevant to Connor right now, what's exciting, what's going to get him to click, what's going to get him to stick around. All of these decisions about what shows up on that page, where you're located, what are you at home, are you on your phone, all these things are, and it's happening in milliseconds behind the scenes with a massive machine learning model to decide what to show you. And this guy was building that. He decided to leave Google to go build a company. He just finished Y Combinator. I, and was like, he needed, like, I need someone on the business side. And so I came in as a co-founder to go build all that out. So that was a company called Lift Igniter. So you ran that company for three, four years? It was about three years. I was on the board then for a while thereafter. Uh, and, and to be clear, he, he was a CEO, so I was just co-founder. So I think we, we co-ran it in a sense. Um, right. Uh, and then we um, built it out and, and it ended up getting sold to a company called Maven, uh, sort of a, a marketing company. How did that exit happen? So you're, you're building this company and you're scaling it. Um, did they approach you or did you run a full process? The company was not taking off the way we expected or wanted. And so okay. the process is being run and you know, seeing if there are buyers up there, the technology is really powerful. We, we're getting clear lift. I will say, I think today I, I tell people when I still hear people try to build the same thing, like, oh, we're going to personalize every website out there. And I was like, well, how are you going to charge for that? Because the real challenge that happened in that space was attribution. So okay. attribute, what I mean by that basically is if you land on my consumer goods, direct to consumer product website, right? And so yeah, I have shoes on my website or something. And I personalize exactly the right shoe you're going to see. You, you go purchase that shoe. Did you purchase that shoe because my personalization was so good or because the rest of the marketing team did great work to get you to show up at the website in the first place? This is almost like another version of the first company, whenever you were looking at Optimizely essentially does A-B testing and they very they mess around with very basic changes to the website. You're doing a more advanced version of that. And like, yeah. if you can point to like A-B test saying like, hey, hyper-personalized is this and your base model is doing this and that's, that delta is where we're providing value. Optimizely used to be a relatively affordable subscription, but I feel like you almost leapfrogged again where you're like, we're going to build this nice tech, essentially. We did. And that was the idea. And, and Tony, you mentioned optimizing. We actually had a conversation with them about them acquiring us as well. And um, because it was, the, it was the right sort of thesis. Now, but I think the challenge they had was very similar to ours, which was, how do you really prove you're providing that much of an uplift in value? And then are, is it just someone's believing that you're providing that uplift? Where does that fit in the stack? How do you sell that the right way? And it really led to its own set of challenges. But so Maven realized it needed some sort of solution in that space for sort of a lot of the multimodal and multivariate testing in, in um, optimizations. And this was a, a decent fit for the team. And, and they hired pretty much the large majority of the team on to, to join them as well. And at that point, I mean, it wasn't that big. At that point, I think we only had about 10 or, or 15 total people on the team, mostly engineers. They're great engineers. So it was a good enough of an exit. Well, that's awesome. How did that change your life? Not very much. Um, and, and, and I mean that in a good way. And I mean that in a good way, right? So maybe unlike a lot of founders, and you certainly speak to a lot of them, I tend to be someone who's pretty content and satisfied in some ways with things. Like I'm, I, I want to learn every day and I'm changing and growing every day. Things are good. Not in the sense I don't want to make change and I don't want to keep pushing myself. I have a house in San Francisco where my family can live. That, that is already, I've, that, that changed my life in that sense. Mm -hmm. And that's like a big win. Um, but beyond that, I don't need a lot more. I like to walk. I bike everywhere. Like, I don't, I don't care about, I want to get rid of things. I don't want to buy a lot more things. Um, what's fun for me is like, the opportunity to go speak to people like you 
and learn from you. That's cool. And that doesn't cost that much money beyond us being willing to spend some time together. Yeah. And there's something special about having that pressure off, I'm sure. Like once you you have that experience, you know, you're able to kind of let your mind roam. And if you think it's exciting, if you want to have a conversation with another entrepreneur, you have time to do that. I think I had my head down so much running my company that I didn't spend as much time outside of it as I probably should have. Do you feel that way? I do. Um, and, and certainly I do now. I mean, I, I have two young kids and I think that actually it's basically, this is a thesis of mine and we can talk about it a bit, but it basically, we as people, forget entrepreneurs, we only have time in our lives to do two things really well at any given moment, can, can choose two things and that's it. Everything else falls by the wayside to, to a large extent. And so I've consciously made a decision that I'm going to focus on work and building my company. I owe it to my team. I owe it to my customers. I owe it to myself. I have things I still want to do. I have things I believe I can get. And then my family. And those are the two things I spend a lot of time in, which means that I don't have time for hobbies. I get my workout in by literally biking my kids to school every day. And that's like my workout, which is sort of a joke of a workout. But it's a workout. Something. I get outside. Um, but I don't have time. You know, I, I, I have great friends, but I don't have a lot of time to see them. And those are just things you decide to give up. So yeah, I can't. I wish I had more time for other things. But I made a conscious decision that I want to be excellent as a CEO and running a company, and I want to be excellent as a father, parent, and spouse. Hey, podcast listeners. Eight years ago, I started a company called Support Ninja. It's an international hiring, training, managing, outsourcing company to help you find the best talent anywhere. If you guys are interested in hiring international talent, check out supportninja.com. Cheers. Whenever you started Levy, in some ways, it's your first bootstrap company. How is that different than being VC backed. The biggest probably difference is I really feel like I can take the long-term perspective on things, which in a VC backed space, you can't. You're making your your time frame is 18 months, if not less, maybe 12 months before you start your next fundraise. So you're on a just a different accelerated timeline. So you're hiring people who are here for the long term, hopefully, who are excited to build something really big, who recognize that it's going to take a bit of time. Um, which means, you know, you might hire people who are less mercenary. There are a lot of people in the startup tech world who are pretty mercenary. They're going to go to the hottest company. They're going to jump in for 12 months. And if it's not crushing it, they're going to jump right out. And those people, they can get the job done. And you're going to pay them a lot of money for it. We don't have that sort of people at Levy because in the end, you join us because you are energized by our mission, our vision. And I would argue by the fact that like, you probably will make as much, if not more at Levy than you would at one of those startups because unlike them, you'll be out of a job in 12 months because they overpaid you. And they're trying to grow too fast because that's what their VCs need them to do. You'll get paid less with us, but we'll be around for long term. So your probably net will be the same. And we have a much higher chance of our equity having value. Um, that's will, true. Will it be multi-billion dollar value? I don't, I don't know. It could be. I mean, there's that chance exists, but at least it has some value. Unlike 90% of startups, which they'll give you equity and it's going to go to zero. The chance of it going to zero is 90% because 90% will fail. It's a long-term company. You're working with people. You can have a long-term relationship with companies. I mean, like the average, uh, like you probably have relationships that will span three, five, six plus years, the longer that you run this business. One of our customers who's been with us for, for about three years recently churned. The reason they churned was they actually hired their internal person they were working with from us. They hired that person to go do a lot of the operations for them internally. And we have a clause in our contract that protects us from some of that. And financially, it's, it's okay. And what I don't get when it, with these companies is like, our mission is to remove. I, I utterly want to destroy the job of internal operations. Sorry to all the people that are out there who are internal operators. Like, you are overhead and costs for your companies. You're not part of the core business for what they're doing. You're not the product team. You're not the go-to-market team. My job is to build a company that can come in there, do this job faster, better, and cheaper than you ever can. Let's talk about this a little bit because we both work in different outsourcing companies and we both had like that clause, right? What we do is we work with these teams and we work with these people and we provide value in this way. But to my knowledge, there is not a outsourcing company out there where they bake into the model that, hey, we will be your launch pad. Like we will help you get set up. But I don't know of any company that's like, we will help you transition and build an outsourcing arm for yourself. That's not something that I've ever seen before. And I don't know, like, maybe it doesn't make sense. We had 14 different departments that were running and executing these plays, right? But on the other hand, if you're looking at how do you remove barriers to uh, possibly that, that sale, I think it's an interesting idea after two or three years, like 
what does that transition plan look like? If, if that happens, I, I get it. I understand it. At the same time, as an entrepreneur, it angers me because what it means is we have not proven we there's value above and beyond that individual. And that means right. our product isn't good enough to improve it every day to the point where right. there are things you only can get from us. You will not be able to get it anywhere else. And that becomes a moat that will hopefully keep people through their entire journey. Maybe being overly ambitious. I want to serve every company up to the Fortune 500 should be using Levy someday because it also doesn't make sense for them to have. When you look at, I don't know, a, a, a Ford or GM or IBM or whatever, they have 10% of their people are dedicated to back office tasks. Why? That's not their core competency. It's insane that they are doing it that way. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is that we were talking about the future of work and we were talking about optimism and pessimism. And you said that you were pessimistic on the short term and optimistic in the long term. What, what are your thoughts? Here's the thing that I see happening in the market overall. Um, one, we are more and more, thanks to COVID to some extent, but overall just trends, we're moving into more of a globalized world. So if you believe in a meritocracy, which is one of the core values that Levy has, and I believe in, which that almost by default, if you go from first principles, means you can hire the best people anywhere in the world. And you should. In fact, you financially should hire the best people anywhere in the world. So right there and then, that means the people who are in the US who are paid a lot of money for their roles need to be think being thoughtful. Well, how am I significantly by a large margin better than other people around the world who have access to all the same data, all the same knowledge, all the same training, and in many cases, decent enough infrastructure, at least when you're talking about a strong internet connection, which is all you need nowadays. That democratization of knowledge and skill set is amazing. And it's wonderful for businesses. It'll probably be de-inflationary when it comes to costs that you charge other businesses. And that's probably a net good. It's not great for American employees and white collar employees specifically. So that's going to be a real disruption. And that's just globalization. Then you layer on top the fact that you have a massive change in AI, where AI is going to come for even those, those lower cost jobs. And that's another functional jump in cost savings. So US to international is a functional jump. International to AI is another functional jump. And suddenly you have massive upheaval in, in AI is moving so fast. I love learning. So for me, like every day I get to learn something new about this new AI thing. I want to test. I want to try that. I want to try that. That's really cool. That is, that makes me a pessimist for the short term white collar workers who are either not willing, not able, not even fully understanding that they need to reskill themselves every single day to remain relevant. And even then it might not be enough. And that is worrisome for all of them, myself included, like all of us, um, what, are, what are the jobs going to be? And then the long term optimism though is, I also think AI is going to lead us to a world where we're a true world of abundance, where you don't have to work if you don't want to, everything will be available. There's that presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, uh, mm -hmm. like, when was that? Four, eight years ago? I mean, that was, uh, I say, yeah, he was talking about ago, universal first. basic income, and now he's looking pretty good. That's probably where this all heads at some point. Is people will need some level of support. The cost to, to enable that support will be relatively low. And the people who want to work will find ways to work. And it will unleash, though, a huge amount of human creativity, human optionality, which could be wonderful in a lot of ways, right? There's a lot of people who are in jobs they don't enjoy. So this will free them up to choose the jobs they want to do when they want to do them. There's going to be a little bit of a shock to the system as far as our economy and then a little bit of a shock to the system for us, like evolutionary speaking. We're not used to being inundated with so much information and uh, it's a little it's a little shocking. And so there's going to be a little bit of a, a transition period and those that uh, ride the wave are going to be well off and we just need to be cognizant of the impact that maybe not everyone can transition and maybe they might need a little bit of help. So it's going to be interesting yeah. to see how things work out I, in a bit. I hope our infrastructure systems in world can be set up in a way to handle that. I don't know if it is set up to that because it's just the government always moves in much more slowly compared to everything else. It yeah. If you're asking so Facebook bad. how they make money, then uh, you're, you're in a rough, you're in a rough spot. Exactly. So <laughs> that's where we're at. And that's like, and that's, that's a real problem given how fast this is all happening. And that's where, so that's where I'm a pessimist in the near term future, the next, let's say 10 years, which is not really that much time in the grand scheme of things. If we get through the next 10 years, mostly intact, um, then yeah, like I'm a super optimist because the, the world will be abundant. AI is going to unlock so many things that is science fiction today in dramatically changing 
the way we live, view the world, things we can do. So I'm excited, but it's going to be a rough period. Adam, on your end, you have Levy, but you also invest in a ton of companies. What are some of the ones that you're super excited about if you want to give them a, a plug or talk about why they're so cool? A company called BetterUp. It's their executive coaching for everybody. They had real trouble raising money. I'm going to elect to their CEO. Well, this needs to happen. Why is it called executive coaching? When, which implies, of course, it's just coaching for executives. That sounds insane. If it's valuable for executives to get coaching, how do we make it valuable for everybody to get coaching? Yeah. Um, to the point where, by the way, like all of our, our sort of core delivery people on our team, we call them operations partners. We get them executive coaching from BetterUp at Levy today. And they've crushed it, but, and they've worked really hard and built a ton of stuff. And it's so impressive. And like another one, um, Human Interest, a 401k company. The whole thesis, how do we dramatically lower the cost of 401ks? These are companies that made investments a long time ago. Um, on the more recent front, uh, there's a, a company called Puzzle. Um, uh, they are redoing um, kind of what it means to the next generation QuickBooks in some ways and just doing really cool things there. Uh, and then, so there's companies like that that, that just get me excited. Um, and of course, you never know who's going to be successful, who's not. Mm. But um, I don't know, those are, those are some of them. Your journey is a little unique in that you had a product and then you spun out a services business. I've seen a lot of services business try to spin up a product. And that's, that's usually pretty hard. Like depending on who your technical partner is, it's very hard for a services business to be like, okay, I'm going to go into Figma, start working in wireframe, start figuring out uh, what the user experience is going to be like. That takes a different, almost like muscle to do. But actually, I'm curious, were there things that support Ninja? Hey, how do we either automate or increase our margin profile of various product lines? Some of that must have been like some, maybe not a product directly that you'd push out to customers, but some sort of automation on the back end or something. Or was it not? We're going to just train our people really well and hire really well and market really well. And that leads to a successful business. It definitely starts out with the latter, right? You're just like, hey, like we need to make outsourcing approachable. How do you do that? You um, make the profiles, like you do a certain level of due diligence and you systematize that and you process that and you, you create a product, right? And then, but now with the recent changes, every single customer that goes in, we do a process map. Like we outline, like here's their user journey. And we have a team that's dedicated at looking at what does that backend process look like? And what are the different ways that we can help? And we include automation and AI into everything that we do for the client, like right out of the gate. And so you have these bigger players like Teleperformance and Accenture um, that are just kind of leveraging manpower in bulk to do some of these tasks. And we're kind of nipping at their heels in a way. And in a way, we're also kind of limiting our revenue uh, potential by being the player that's willing to provide that service right out of the gate. So that's something that we definitely had to implement over the past three years and is a little bit different from the original model. Do you find that AI is changing your business significantly? Is that like something that's going to be more and more part of what you offer? And does it, does it reduce the need for, for people? It's definitely something that we offer, but because we offer it out of the gate, we're factoring that in and then there's still room for people involved in that process, right? And so uh, we had this product called Sidekick, which is essentially just like, um, we're looking at different types of tasks and different types of processes and we're providing recommendations or we're trying to make things faster. And um, that's definitely something that's that's helpful. So whenever we're looking at AI, if we don't factor it in, someone else will. How do you make that person like a command center and then how do you upskill them? And even if they leave Support Ninja and they go off to another job, they're, they have a skill set that's pretty valuable. And that's where I think globalization gets pretty exciting as you find these super creative people that are working in different countries and seeing them come together and, and build their skill set is yeah. pretty, pretty cool. We had like a hackathon, I think two or three weeks ago, right? Where they're all, um, which is kind of cool to see inside a company, but seeing people lock, lock each other inside a room and, and work on different ideas and get excited is almost like you're spinning up entrepreneurs inside a company and they're probably going to start a company at some point. That's pretty cool to see. I think we're going to move into a world where everyone is an entrepreneur to some extent. I mean, like, because what's going to, the change, excuse me, the change in uh, the number of jobs, like normal, standard, big company, white collar jobs, because of that change that I just sort of, we talked about, um, people will be forced to become entrepreneurs. 
but it also the cost to become an entrepreneur, entrepreneur drops significantly. So you can hire Levy, you can hire Support Ninja. You suddenly need to a company of one person and all these other tools are out there to support you in your mission and journey. Um, and that, in some ways, once can be very freeing for a lot of people, um, albeit scary, but I, I hope there are more entrepreneurs out there. Let's take some trends. So like how long a person works in, inside a, a company? Like it used to be 40 years to get a watch, right? But now it's like one or two years and that's shrinking, right? And so that's kind of lending itself towards like you're acting as a company with your own skill set and you're, there's more flexibility for you to move over to a different job, right? So that's pretty entrepreneurial. Um, and then like the lack of friction to spin up a good looking website with good content and good copy and be able to have access to automation tools that um, like would have been shocking if you were to look like 10 or 20 years ago. I mean, these things make it very approachable that if you're enterprising and you're excited about learning a bunch of stuff, you can just pick an industry and really hone in, find your niche, launch a product and do so pretty quickly. So I'm looking, f I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I think this should be, this should be fun to see. One of the key themes sort of for your, your podcast itself, it was like, what does that success look like? What does one think about over time as, as you have different exits and, and things like that? And I would say kind of, you know, think about that for my own self is look, in the end, you have to come up to things with a level of optimism and excitement and energy. That's what gets me up every day. It's like, man, there's so much to read. There's so much to do. I wish I had more time in the day. <laughs> so how do I optimize then? But then you go from that and how do I optimize it? How do I become more healthy? How do I sleep better? How do I wake up every day, bring my best self to everything I'm doing? Is that giving me more time to learn and more opportunity to learn? How do I keep leveling that up? Part of the journey and the excitement part that I'm trying every day and doing my best, it leads to a level of, at least for me, happiness, contentedness that is hopefully a lifelong game and I can look back when I'm, I, it's a different discussion now, but I, but I, my goal is to live to, you know, 100, 120, but like get to that point to look back and say, you know what? I did it, man. And I learned a lot. I tried so many different things. I had so many cool experiences and, and most important, I made the logical choices that made sense for me in my life. I, I took control of those, those choices and didn't let those choices take control of me. And that's, that hopefully would be the big win that I'm shooting for. Adam, that's awesome. Adam, where should people go to find you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, um, you can certainly find me on Twitter or X. I, I kind of always call it Twitter just because I'm a former employee of that uh, of Twitter. So to me, it will always be Twitter. Um, I think it's at ASPEC00, at ASPEC00. Um, you can certainly find us at Levy. So levy.company, so C-O-M-P-A-N-Y is our website. Please learn about us more there. I'm very active on LinkedIn at Adam Spector two, I believe is my, my unfortunate, I wanted to get, you know, Adam Spector one or just without the two, but, um, uh, it's okay being number two as well. I, I don't mind that. Um, if, if everyone can win, so it's fine. Um, but certainly on LinkedIn as well, I am in pretty active with posting a bunch of videos and, and hopefully giving back to folks too, right? This is, I learned from you, you learned from me. And so many people have been generous with their time and energy as I built my career. And I, and I hope I can get back the same way. And you also have your podcast, right? So we have to, yeah. yes, have to entrepreneurial go excellence. Out. Yes. Very everyone cool. should check on entrepreneurial excellence, a bit of a tongue twister on purpose, but hopefully memorable, but learn, learn what it means to be an excellent entrepreneur. No one's fully cracked the code, but there are a lot of people who are really good, such as yourself, Connor. So. Um, it's great to have you. Yeah. Thank you. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.